Okay, uh, hello everyone. Thank you very much for coming to today's AIWA Los Angeles, Las Vegas e town hall meeting, uh, which is a happy uh, uh, you know, occasion for our uh, people to meet the general public, uh, to have interaction. So today's topic is going to, uh, is, is a very exciting one. Uh, it's been a long way coming and, uh, uh, but this is, uh, is uh, the, the, the tentative schedule today. So we are doing some short introduction. Then our young professional chair uh, is uh, Akash. He's uh, going to say something that he's all very passionate about uh, AIWA, aerospace and helping young, young professional uh, or you know, the community in general. And then we have our uh, new uh, STEAM K-12 outreach chair, uh, Kushbu. Uh, she's all very excited about education with the students. Uh, she's even helped out for the university affair in addition to the outreach to the school and the classroom for, for K-12. And uh, we have a, a wonderful uh, 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 um, young adult, young, young adult, uh, he's, uh, she did a wonderful job using Raspberry Pi, which was just amazing. You know, you, can't, you cannot miss, you know, this is, you have to enjoy it. And unfortunately, Mr. David Miyamoto, uh, he, uh, he have some, you know, SAT, so I think he had to take care. So he cannot join us this time, but he's, he said he's very interested for the next in the future. So we'll see what he'll be doing in the future. So I will do some also the basic demo. And then we'll have to this and the very exciting talk from Urban. Uh, Mr. Huang is the uh, chair of IEEE. Uh, in Orange County, then uh, the then followed by uh, Mr. Liam Kennedy. Uh, you probably heard of him twice last year, but uh, uh, it, it's always uh, it's very dynamic. You know, it's uh, talk these things differently. Okay, so try to speed things up. So before the event, I want to we want to make it, make sure these things are clear. You know, we have been planning this for quite a long time. Uh, but initially, we are trying to look for a speaker for this event. Uh, he could not actually engage. Uh, come in quickly. So I, I jump in and we try to put things because we've been actually working on it for a while. And again, this, this event is for fun. It's to for networking, to get uh, informed, inspired. It is not intended to say, you know, we are opening a, a school to teach and please pay tuition. No, that's not like that. We, we are non nonprofit. So the same for uh, the IEEE. And uh, this is for demo for everybody. And uh, we check around, you know, because it's hard you know, we want everybody to know about it, but we also understand, you know, for, for early career people, you know, the different uh, senior people, uh, experienced people at different level understanding. And uh, then another point is now we are not trying to sell the product. You know, sometimes the people understand we have a topic like Super Honing, we are trying to sell Super Honing, no, because th these are just the famous product, you know, people have been using it. So it's, it's an example to inspire people. There are actually many kinds of product on the market and actually even Intel, you know, AMD, they are jumping into this market for a small board computer. So there's uh, it's, it's, it's just so many of them. So we have no intention or interest in selling any product, but we have interest to get people uh, inspired. And again, there is a big competition for CISC or RISC, this kind of uh, computer architecture. Uh, the AR, ARM architecture is, belongs to the RISC, uh, RSIC. Uh, then Intel belong to CISC, but you know they, they are they have been fighting long years. It's not our you know try to promote each other. Next time we might say something about Intel. So there, obviously there are a lot of things. Uh, Urban probably will talk about a lot of things uh, about IoT, edge for computing. That, but you know I want to kind of make make sense. Actually, a lot of things actually came from aerospace or defense. As you know, F-35 these days, they, they are just not fighting alone. They have interconnect sensor everywhere. North government building this uh, ANAAQ-37. This is a DSS system. It's basic to uh, 360 degree uh, around, uh, you know, information system to have situa situation awareness. And we know the drone X-47B and the Mars rover, they all have a lot of issue about situation awareness. And they have been doing this, they have been doing this for a very long time. Uh, but you know those those um, Raspberry Pi Arduino is a good introductory thing. You know people do uh, hobby or you know to prototyping or doing uh, study research. <clears throat> so you know this is uh, borrowed this is from a, a magazine uh, and for military report. As you can see in, in the battlefield, you know they have to have everything has to be connected to each other. 
you know, satellite UAV, ground, ground forces, you know, drones, even the undersea uh, you know, system. So there's tons of sensors there. So th that you'll gradually see why these are important and how the military or defense uh, are actually, uh, you know, have a lot of things to say, but they, they generally, they don't talk about this because as you know, this uh, uh, issue behind it. No, we don't want their secret, but it's, it's just in general for uh, engineering and uh, science. Uh, a little bit of logistics, I'll try to finish out quickly. So thanks to AIAA. So if anything goes wrong, you know, disconnect, please keep trying. Uh, you can use phone dialing if bandwidth is limited. Okay, so uh, please try to sign you, you, uh, you, 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 with you, your real name. It's better we can identify you. Uh, Q and A, please type in Q and A box uh, or click raise hand to be muted more mostly toward the end of the presentation. Uh, and the Zoom has been uh, improving a lot for privacy and security. Uh, we also do uh, been doing our best to block out the intruders. So please feel uh, you know relaxed, assured. Uh, Southern California has been, been very amazing. A lot of aerospace activity, defense, you know, and uh, you just saw the amazing Mars 2020 perseverance landing. It's just amazing, uh, great success. And uh, if you join Attaway, uh, we'll probably do some event uh, just to get people familiar with this. If you join Attaway, you can immediately join the Attaway Engage, which is an online tool with the discussion board, open forum. You can immediately connect to. Uh, aerospace, uh, uh, you know, uh, expert, the other one members worldwide. Uh, so please stay tuned and keep, uh, you can try to look into this. And then we keep doing event, you know, so keep people, everybody uh, know what's going on in aerospace, uh, so have fun. So, you know, next week we have expert talking about sustainable aviation, electric hybrid aircraft, but that's, we don't call it that way because they also biofuel, which is very important. And then we also never forget uh, the importance of the young people, students, and uh, so on and so forth. And uh, we have a very good membership program, the Educated Free. Our membership uh, chair, Aldo, uh, Mr. Martinez, has been doing a wonderful, amazing job. So uh, uh, membership, no problem, you know, uh, he will take care, we will assist. Okay, so I'm actually the first, first one uh, to present, but in my session, we invited the uh, uh, the Vivian uh, to show her great uh, effort. And uh, also, I also want to take the chance to have um, um, this, uh, the uh, IEEE uh, Orange County Section Chair, Owen, uh, to say something. He's our second speaker, but uh, because, you know, uh, he's also co-sponsoring this event. So, Owen, uh, could you say, Owen, could you say a few words? Uh, yeah, I can. To everyone. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Uh, good morning. My name is Irvin. I am the chair of the IEEE Orange County section. Uh, I want to mention that there will be a raffle today of uh, Raspberry Pi 2s mostly. Um, they came from one of our IEEE members who runs a robotics school here in Irvine called Boston Bites. And I will um, talk more about that later. But just wanted to um, say good morning to everyone, and I hope everyone is ready to uh, learn. Fantastic. This is amazing. We have a, a very uh, enthusiastic, uh, very energetic people, and uh, that's a great topic today. So uh, that which means we are moving into uh, the, uh, the, the demo now. Um, let me see. Oh, I see some comment here. Okay, no problem, just say hello, Daniela. Great, you joined us. Uh, so what I would do is, um, I will say a few words, then I'll, uh, ask, uh, I will uh, have uh, Vivian to show, because what she was doing is just amazing. I <laughs> cannot wait to see what uh, her demo. Uh, but before that, I want to try to say something uh, just shortly. Uh, as again, I, I mentioned previously, you know, this, this kind of, uh, uh, IoT or or this kind of you know, sensor and you know connection everywhere is actually vital to the national interest. It has been there. It's like internet or GPS. They they started from uh, defense, uh, but they've been very very instrumental to the uh, community worldwide uh, civilian uh, life. Uh, so it's just amazing story, you know how. And we also know the uh, Apollo you know program, the technology benefit the. Uh, uh, the, uh, um, the civil life. But actually one thing very important, 
it's actually more important is we should have the Akash, uh, our young professional uh, chair, uh, to say a few words uh, in operation uh, speech. So Akash, are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Go ahead. Okay, hi everybody. Uh, it's very nice to meet you all virtually. Uh, my name is Akash uh, and I'm currently the YP chair with AIAA. I've been involved with this chapter, helping out and plan YP related events for the last couple of years. Uh, I've been involved in in-person events mostly, uh, and some of you may recognize me if you had a chance to attend, which turned out great as, uh, you know, they served as networking events for the young professionals and early career. Uh, can you all see me? Okay. Um, so I was involved in in-person events and some of you might recognize me from there. <laughs> so I, I realized I didn't have my camera on. Um, in the SoCal area. So it was more for early career professionals and young professionals. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's a good way to learn about the industry while getting to meet, you know, younger people and new people in the industry that you, you'd work with. And it's a small community. So uh, the focus was towards young engineers and seniors graduating. Uh, I'm currently a systems and business development engineer. And prior to this role, I work in aviation consulting. Right now, I work in integrating control systems, process automation, and robotics for a variety of different industries that covers aerospace, mining, chemicals, materials, and pharmaceuticals. Uh, my background is in aerospace engineering, and uh, during my undergrad, I spent some time at NASA Ames Research Center, where I spearheaded the public relations program to support and advance NASA's mission to inspire the next generation through education. And this experience was definitely a gateway. It, it, it signified my genuine belief in involving future generations through you know, some exposure and encouragement to solve some of the biggest problems in STEM, business, and education. And that's part of my involvement here as I serve as the Young Professionals Chair um, with the LALB. Uh, and being a STEM advocate, I empower and support students, and I've also helped underprivileged communities and universities around Los Angeles and in this role, I'm devoted um, to setting up conferences, educational seminars, and most importantly, networking events for the young professionals and early career professionals around Los Angeles. Uh, now granted, this was a lot easier pre-pandemic. However, with the current situation, we are adapting via Zoom, and hopefully we will begin in-person events once you know, things start to relax uh, in, the, in the future. Um, but, you know, I, I love these programs at Ken Presence. It's with, it's with a great purpose to educate a general audience in STEM activities, but I'd like to hone that focus more and encourage anyone out here to, you know, reach out to me. I'm going to put my email in the chat below. Uh, you know, reach out to me if you've got any ideas, seminars, or other pathways that you've been thinking of to help out early career or younger professionals, you know, whether it be in underprivileged communities or just around LA or set up networking events. Uh, and how we can work together with EIAA to inspire and foster the young budding community of talent uh, around us for a better tomorrow. So I don't, again, I don't want to take a lot, of, a lot of the time. So I, once again, would like to thank Ken here for graciously allowing me to speak in this event. And I really look forward to getting to know more of you. So please feel free to reach out. I'm going to put my email below. And uh, yeah, I look forward to this event. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Akash. It's amazing. Uh, we have this uh, such dynamic, uh, energetic young people. You know, for you with Air Double is our uh, bless, uh, blessing. Really appreciate. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, yeah. Anytime. Actually, this. Honestly speaking, we used to have just one month monthly meeting, and uh, actually, all many council members show up. Like membership chair come out too, as people sign up. You know, they chair to. This is the. Uh, this is we always call this monthly section meeting. There's a reason behind it because this is for the uh, the board, the council, or, or general to meet the public. It's a great opportunity. Uh, right now, we kind of do a little more, but but it, it's the same idea. So you are welcome to come back to the general meeting because, uh, honestly speaking, you can see actually this event. It doesn't serve the purpose of specific for uh, young professional, uh, young professional or STEM classroom outreach. No, because this is for general public. If yeah, there's some kind of they, they can see some kind of thing, but it's not uh, tailored for that. So we need more specific thing. That's why AIW has been very successful because we each each have the level have different people taking care. You know, great people like you. Yeah, exactly. I love that. This is more of a general audience. Yeah, but I'd yeah. love to, you know, this is a great event for people to come in and, you know, we can see how we can tailor it more for young professionals. Yeah. That's sort of the idea. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, every time young people always try to, you know, get them engaged with AWA, you know, 
well, actually everyone, not just, but when I saw the, you know, energy, they certainly, you know, have certain things that look up to uh, the other way can contribute, you know, you know, that's, uh, that's really fantastic. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, is Kushbu here? Kushbu, are you here? Kushbu is our uh, young, uh, new uh, STEAM uh, K-12 out outreach chair. Uh, she has been very passionate about, you know, uh, education. Uh, so not only is helping the K-12, he is also supporting the education chair function. Uh, AWA has been very successful because each uh, specific uh, background or, or level uh, has uh, one specific uh, uh, officer to take care of them. For example, education chair for university, uh, YP just saw that we had career workforce, you know, for more experienced people. Uh, and so, so uh, in a sense that um, uh, there's an all very vital, very important, everybody, uh, you know, the very, you know, kind of fully function in the AWA, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 the design, the uh, activity that's, uh, is, is like a full team, it's very powerful. That's why AWA has been very successful. Okay, so Kushbu, it doesn't seem to, she might have been busy, but I can tell you she has been doing a wonderful job. She just cannot, can't wait to help st uh, the K-12 students reach out and uh, uh, supporting the uh, university students and uh, help uh, uh, young, young, young uh, woman, student, professional, uh, no, sorry, uh, as, as a young woman professional helping the students. Uh, so uh, she's amazing, but unfortunately I think she is busy. Now, fly to where? Yeah, I see it. Oh, pie aware there. Yeah. Ron, can, can, can you see this? Yes, yes, I can see it now. I see a map with uh, airplanes moving around. So, is this uh, look, looks familiar to you? Well, I've seen things that are similar, maybe not this one exactly. Yeah, this is the uh, ADSB. You know the uh, the 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 the, the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the ADSB the uh, the signal to you know uh, uh, you know to keep distance be uh, among each other. I think it's called the uh, the diffraction diffraction uh, surveillance detection uh, um, uh, broadcast a surveillance broadcast right ADSB. So basically, this is a uh, a device I built uh, for ADSB at low cost. Uh, so you can see now you can track uh, the the air traffic uh, that I can uh, I can receive. Uh, so you, you know so you see the airplane killed. It, it, sometimes you can see the helicopter sign. You know small air, airplane, and if you hover among them, you can see some information. And on the right hand side, you can see some of the information. And now I'm going to show you. The device itself, uh, so you can see it's kind of fun. So, uh, oh, uh, gosh, please help, uh, uh, Leon, help me. I'm going to, you know, switch to the device. One second. Ken, are you aware of a program called Flight Radar 24? It is somewhat similar. Yeah, but uh, th this is a little bit like uh, IoT. So whatever I detected, uh, also report to a, a major server. So if you you can, let me see. Um, so if you do you get your data from the internet, or you have your own uh, receiver? Th this you see, this is my own receiver. Okay. Uh, but I also report uh, can feed, feed this thing into the uh, the national one, so they have a bigger larger uh, system. Yeah, Flight Radar 24 is a uh, an app on my Android that uh, uses an uh, internet connection to get uh, all the traffic. Yeah, Ron, that, I know you're expert in this, so I, I want to, you know, get you excited about this. And uh, let me, okay, so uh, in the, now I'm going to switch to a screen. So you can see the actual device uh, that I built. Let's see, does it show up? Yes, that's above title screen. Oh, oh, okay, sorry, sorry. My mistake. 
How about now? We got it. Great, yes, great. Sorry. Now I see a video. Yeah, so you can see this is a uh, Raspberry uh, Pi 4B, Model B with the Pi Aware. Uh, then with, uh, well, a small monitor. And uh, I, I just try to play this one, his thing, because this thing needs to be run for a very long time. So I put a uh, color for his thing there uh, to make sure it's, uh, it's okay. So, and you can see this is the prior away device plus uh, the 1090 megahertz filter. There's another frequency, 987, but wrong. I heard that uh, 987 seems to be, uh, I think they were used for different different type of aircraft. Uh, so, so I start with 10, 1090 megahertz. Uh, it's two different kinds of things. 1090 is what the airlines use and 987 is what most smaller general aviation uses. And oh. so a lot of the units have to receive on both to be able to get all the data. Although the FAA also does a um, echo kind of a thing where all the data they get in gets sent back out on 1090. So you may well, if, if you're within range of one of the FAA antennas, you can get the uh, 987 data indirectly. Yeah, excellent. Yeah, so uh, Ron, you see this is a great uh, application for, for for Raspberry Pi, and uh, it, it's really fun. It's just uh, when I see this uh, uh, the signal, I, the next step I'm trying to I will try to improve the signal with with the uh, 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 better antenna. Uh, so I will discuss with you so we can do do something uh, to get see something fun that come out of this. Yeah, thank you. So I, I'm going to switch to the the next demo, but it probably take me two minutes to reboot. So uh, Arvan, Akash, Liam, could you help? Uh, fill in the two minutes, three minutes. Hello? Yeah, Ken, this is Phil. I'd like to ask a question. Oh. Um, AD ADSB apparently is automatic dependent broadcast uh, surveillance. Yeah, dependent. Yes. And maybe Ron can help. Uh, this is <clears throat> basically this is detecting other airplanes, right, uh, Ron? Uh, the idea is that for many years, airplanes have requ had a requirement to have a transponder that basically echoes back or replies back to a ground pulse from the FAA. So the FAA would have radars, you've seen them all around the airports and stuff, where it would send out a pulse and the transponder would reply to that with some very limited data. And that's the way air traffic control system worked for many, many years. Then beginning, uh, the very beginning of last year, the FAA implemented a new requirement where every aircraft uh, with some constraints has to have a different kind of transponder on board that's called ADS-B. One of the differences is that it is no longer replying to an interrogation from the ground. It is now beeping on its own and puts out a lot more data. And that's why you can see um, you know, velocity vectors and call signs and all kinds of other things about it. And since all the aircraft are putting those out from the air, then basically you can receive it many places on the ground as well. And it looks like what Ken has is an, a local antenna that he's listening to the various aircraft above. Okay, so so the, every airplane is equipped with this transmitter to transmit their velocity, altitude, etc. So Correct. there's some sort of a separate some sort of a separate black box would be needed to take that information in and, and provide a warning to uh, to the pilot. Well, it's not a separate box. Most of them are integrated together. So I have one box that does all that. It sits there and oh. pulses out. Uh, at the appropriate frequency, I happen to be pulsing out at 1090, but then it also, mine is a dual receive, so it receives both 987 and 1090, and so therefore I can, ex yeah. I can visually see on my internal maps of the cockpit what all the other aircraft are around me. Yeah, that's great. Uh, so I'm switching to this another demo. So give me, uh, you know, booting up one or two uh, two minutes. So in the meanwhile, so feel free to uh, discuss about this. I'm waiting to boot. Yeah, the problem is I have many, actually many of those over the years, but the problem is I only have one or two <laughs> Raspberry Pi. So I have to swap uh, between or you know swap the car. Uh, so I really apologize for this. And the, the internet, I set up a practice and it just, you know, the minute it just had some issue as you saw, but it's getting better now. Um, okay. 
Uh, so another question for Ron. Uh, Ron, as we as we uh, introduce um, urban air transport, where we have not only airplanes, we got for airplanes flying in every direction at every a whole range of different altitudes. Uh, is ADSB going to be good enough to cover that, or will there be have to be another next generation uh, to uh, accommodate uh, a large fleet of urban helicopters or or, or uh, or the equivalent traveling all over the city? Well, that's a good observation. And the short answer is it's probably not sufficient. Um, it's maybe a starting point, but there isn't a guarantee that all aircraft are gonna have ADSB. Right now, it's only required uh, within certain dimensions of large airports, for instance. So like right around LA uh, vicinity, yes, that, that is okay. But outside of the LA area, it wouldn't necessarily be uh, required. Yeah, Ron, you're right. It's, uh, I was really fascinated by this. Okay, so I'm, I managed to start the next demo. So I'm going to switch to a screen. Uh, can you see um, a camera with, with the monitor? Yes. So I don't know if you can see what it's trying to do. So this camera, I don't know if you see the green scale, uh, square around it. Can you see it showed TV 60, 65%? Yeah, I can see frames per second, you know, TV yeah, 67%. I pointed yeah. the camera. This, I, I, actually, I'm sorry because, uh, you know, I, another camera is, the good camera is not, you know, not really working very well. So I use uh, not so high resolution, but it, it did the, did a job. So this is a kind of machine learning process. So there's a bar from a model and, uh, uh, and learning try to do the object detection in real time. So now I'm pointing to a um, toothbrush. Let me see if you can recognize it. I can see the toothbrush. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to see if you can recognize it. So can you see a, a, a screen of output of temperature? Yes, it's labeled COM3 with a bunch of temperature readouts. Yeah, it keep updating, right? Okay, so I'm going, this is a reading from Arduino device. So I'm going to switch to a, the camera uh, that uh, show this device. So can you, can you see the, um, the device? Uh, sorry, can you see it? I see a camera of a breadboard and other device with wires. Yeah, uh, uh, well, the direction is a little bit confusing. So, okay. So it is actually from this one. So this is the Arduino Uno device. Uh, it's, it's similar like a Raspberry Pi, but it's actually different. It is uh, as a microcontroller. It has a CPU, but it's not as powerful, but it's actually a microcontroller. And both of them can actually control FPGA. So maybe next time I can demo FPGA, but this, this uh, uh, both this has their capabilities. So good or bad. And they used to have separate market because Raspberry Pi is more like a computer. Uh, but I can kind of pop you in with uh, this device. It's called a Raspberry Pi Pico. Well, it's the other way. They just come out in January. So Raspberry Pi is trying to compete with uh, Arduino, uh, with this micro uh, controller, this is not a computer. Uh, so it's become you know heated con contest. But it's the same thing. Intel tried to jump this with to, with the uh, Windows 10 IoT and uh, the the Core i7, you know, i5 or or the embedded. So at the same thing, like uh, AMD, they have the Ryzen embedded uh, system, that, and they jump into the four four inch by four inch board. But anyway. So you can see this reading, you just saw the temperature was from this uh, little IC, it's called the LM35. It's a, a, a temperature sensor. So you kind of, uh, the Arduino is different from uh, Raspberry Pi because it's analog, analog uh, reading. Uh, Raspberry Pi mostly digital. So basically it reads the, uh, uh, the voltage and uh, convert into 1024, uh, you know, uh, A to D and then read by by the uh, Arduino and then uh, by the program, which is 
you know, you can use, use different kinds of program and uh, to, to do this. And uh, actually, I, I want to show this also because this is kind of fun because people say, oh, you have to do a lot of coding, you know, it's just uh, too much. And, uh, you know, some people like coding, you know, somebody may feel a little bit uh, overwhelmed. So, you know, the, I set, set this up so you can see this thing. This guy here, okay. Okay, so can you see uh, the, the uh, interface with the reading? Yes, I see a, uh, a menu screen, uh, grid, and yeah. 35 controls. Yes, yes. Actually, I was uh, testing this program. Uh, so this is called the lab view. I don't know if you heard about it. Uh, many serious industrial and uh, research uh, institute, they are using lab view, national instrument lab view uh, to do their, uh, those kinds of things for, for, for reading, you know, or sensing or those kinds of things. Um, but you can actually do this, you know, for Raspberry Pi and Arduino. So what do you do instead of programming for, you know, for, for the, uh, uh, coding, you can do this uh, kind of uh, like a black diagram type. You just draw the, uh, pull some uh, device and uh, draw the line. Um, uh, uh, yeah, sorry, that's what I intend to show. So we can see the black diagram thing. So you, you, you can still have some codes, the simple coding there, but this is a different way. Uh, using the different approach, using the diagram for all child type of thing uh, to do. And you can do this for Raspberry Pi and Arduino. Uh, so this is actually the same program I used for doing the same thing, just so outputting the temperature so we can make it very nice. Actually, you can do it, do that too with coding. You can also do very nice, uh, uh, you see this uh, both just from different angle, uh, different way of doing things. Okay. Uh, Ken, <clears throat> does yeah. the Raspberry Pi accommodate Visual Basic uh, or Python, either one? Yeah, yeah. Actually, almost the uh, any language you can think of, like a Visual Studio, C++, C Sharp. I think there is some kind of new program called R. You know, anything you can think of, they they almost almost very likely uh, can do it. I don't I don't know about Fortran or Pascal, but I, I think Visual Basic certainly can do that. Because it's okay. using the the Visual Studio, uh, the, the the library, so no problem. Yeah, the the Pi at, at its basic is a um, is a general purpose computer, so it can run you know many different versions of Linux and and other operating systems. So pretty much anything you can imagine on the the Linux world, you can do on a Raspberry Pi. Uh, you know, it has a desktop interface if you want to use that, and you can use many different uh, development tools. Um, you know, as you'll hear later on, my favorite is, of course, Python. Um, but uh, okay, so uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I recently learned Python. So, do what does, does does the programmer declare what language is being used before actually typing up the code, or does the computer automatically recognize what what language uh, the well, it's a full it's a full on computer interface. So, uh, you know, just like on a desktop computer where you you would uh, develop your code in whatever language you're uh, and whatever development environment you're using, those are all available for the Pi. Um, you know, in my case, uh, I actually uh, do most of my development in a headless manner, uh, which is related to the fact that I, I don't have a desktop interface. I write my code using um, a code uh, writing <coughs> application, usually on my computer using Visual Studio Code, and then I transfer my code over to the Pi to, to run it. But many people will run their code and do the development directly on a Raspberry Pi. It really has now, uh, especially with the Pi Model 4, has a really very capable uh, it's a very capable system for doing your development on the device using its desktop environment. Um, do, you so, have a do you normally compile it before you transfer the Raspberry Pi? No, Raspberry no, Pi it's, 
no, you, it's all, it's, it's basically all done on, um, on, on the Raspberry Pi. So think of the Raspberry Pi like your big computer that you're using the compiler on at the moment. You can do all of that on a Raspberry Pi. Okay, so it um, has its own compiler built in. That's nice. Yeah, yeah, all, all of that stuff. All the resources that you would have on a regular desktop, you can have on a Raspberry Pi. Um, but you know, my, my version is slightly different in that I have a very focused application with ISS above. So I don't have any of the desktop on it. And uh, it is just, you know, the code is in Python files and Python itself is interpreted, but uh, okay, I have so some aspect- interpreter there instead of a compiler. Yeah, yeah, that's how Python really operates uh, everywhere. Okay. It's uh, it's run through through that model. Um, you know, there are ways you can package it up to look like it's uh, pre-compiled, and there is a uh, there is a, a compilation step that the files, uh, when the interpreter compiles them, it'll create a, a runtime file. But uh, that's all hidden from you. You know, really, it's uh, Python is such a superbly um, powerful and flexible language, uh, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, I'm sure you, you could do whatever you'd want to do uh, on the Pi um, if you've got started with Python. Anyhow, I just thought I'd chime in there. Hopefully that was helpful. Okay, so uh, this is the, my, uh, the next, uh, probably the, the, the time is probably almost up. So the, the last uh, demo today, I, I have many more, just uh, unfortunately, I don't have enough, uh, uh, you know, Raspberry Pi. So this is, um, Liam will, will probably know this is kind of, uh, the, 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 I built this is from, this is called the Sense Hat, which was used in the Astro Pi. And you know, that's uh, when the, the Raspberry Pi got famous for, because a few years ago, I think 2015, was the ESA, a British astronaut. Uh, and uh, and uh, French uh, several ESA astronauts they has a device called Astro Pi and uh, they use the same uh, sense hat which is that uh, kind of array of LED so you can kind of show the uh, unfortunately I think it's too bright you cannot see so what it is doing is actually showing the International Space Station uh, location location uh, for example right now it is uh, uh, it's I think passing the uh, South America so actually. I don't know why it's, it is too, it's flashing. So is it showing the- um, Yeah, it's the, in the uh, South Atlantic Ocean right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so above it, so, I should say. The space station hasn't deorbited and splashed down. It's, uh, yeah, it's sorry, above. Yeah, sorry, this is too bright. So I don't know, let me see if I can tone it down. Yeah, that's uh, that's how those things work. Uh, I'll, I'll be doing, I'll be showing the same in a little while too. <laughs> well, this, this is just just the test. I know you, you know very good. So basically, this is uh, the, uh, you can show uh, the uh, longitude uh, uh, latitude, and uh, you can show the city, the state, uh, where, where it, uh, it is, it is uh, every few every other time. And they also have a feature to show you when it will, um, you know, uh, fly over your city. And uh, but also a good thing is actually on this thing, it has also temperature sensor, humidity sensor, pressure sensor. So actually, it is kind of multi-function, multi so it works perfectly well, perfectly well. So this also demonstrates if you want to add any feature uh, on Raspberry Pi, it's called a head. You can design your own head or purchase some special head, you just uh, hook it to it and uh, it's ready good to go. And for um, uh, uh, Arduino, they call the shield, but it's basically a similar thing. So with this, I, I'm coming back to this, uh, uh, to this, uh, um, Kind of introductory thing because you, you look at things that's the basic model, but actually you can, as Vivian already show you, and I also show you a little bit, you know, like this. This is Raspberry Pi, but it's a microcontroller, not a computer. It's a Pico, uh, so you can make it small and it's much cheaper, low power consumption. This is called the Arduino Nano, you know. Uh, so this is. Uh, uh, you, you, you have, they have a lot of variation or you sometimes have no Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth, those kinds of things. And then this is actually how everything got started because when I saw this little device, this is the first generation, uh, Raspberry Pi 1, uh, you know, 2014, I just love it because actually I have been building the small factor computer, all kinds of size, you know, server, 
you know, I just love this. And I just thought I was just amazing. I really want to do this and uh, show people. So I've been thinking about this, finally got the chance. Sorry, I keep bribing, but this is so exciting. I have way much more gadget, you know, so, but unfortunately I'll, I'll next time I'll, I'll show you a lot of fun. Um, so this, I'm, because time is coming up. So I, I have something I want to share with you. Uh, it's kind of fun when you right. think about this uh, uh, Raspberry Pi stuff. So I already mentioned about this uh, defense IoT and uh, this, this uh, you know, things uh, generate like GPS, Apollo, uh, internet things. Uh, oh, this is, Leon, this is the one I was talking about. Yeah, uh, Astro there Pi, you go, uh, Tim Peake, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I have a couple device. of slides talking yeah, yeah, about please, that please. too. No, 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 no. It, uh, I'll do it late, later on. It's oh, okay. uh, but they, that's, they have uh, two, that's perfect. They have two as uh, Astro Pi with the same thing. I would say it's called a sense head, but they, they, there is there are a little different. They are uh, a space hardened, radiation hardened. Now the, the regular one, they they, they don't. Uh, so this is a picture of Raspberry Pi four B just came up. Uh, we've been was using it as well. Uh, the next picture show you what they are. They actually have a, a graphic GPU. Uh, Broadcom, this ARM, this uh, uh, RISC architecture, they have memory, what, uh, two, four, and eight, actually. Uh, they have different you know, can component, video, and uh, this is very uh, important, is the GPIO, uh, uh, you know, you can uh, have the I2C, SPI, URAD serial, uh, those kind of things, they have the uh, USB 3.0, but unfortunately these days, the, the USB uh, 3.2 generation, two coming up, you know, and 20 gigabytes, uh, per second coming up, but uh, some smaller factor computer already have this device, like an Intel Nuke. So uh, it's going to be heated competition. Uh, so this Ardu Arduino. Uh, so you, you, as I said, there's analog power connection. Um, okay, I, I actually I have something I forgot to show you. I, I put it somewhere. Uh, I, I, I think. Uh, sorry, I, I it's probably not here. I, okay, the name of Raspberry Pi actually came from apple because apple is a fruit and the raspberry is a fruit fruit pi is actually python and uh, arduino actually came from a bar uh, in italy because some of the uh, people there trying to have meeting and doing this in some town in a bar uh, named after arduino uh, it is a uh, evera uh, uh, evaria evaria i think it's i think it's, uh, I think it's uh, his, he was uh, in 10 uh, early 11th century, 10 something to 1024, he was the general for the king uh, over there. Uh, uh, his, his name is Arduino, uh, the uh, Avera. And uh, so, so people, the bar was named after him and the people gathered there uh, to, to discuss about Arduino. So that's uh, where the Arduino came out. The program started around 2005, uh, but the pro pro program, different device came up uh, from different uh, time frames. So uh, I, I'll stop here. So I don't know if I have enough time, um, maybe a few minutes. So any any question, I will look into the... Uh, the yeah, Ken, uh, on the programming languages, uh, I, I'm thinking that Arduino only accepts C++. Is that true or...? No, 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 no. Arduino also accept, accept uh, um, Python and you saw that view, can you still do it? And uh, as far as and the C++, uh, of course, C sharp, uh, okay. Java, okay. Java, Java is also a pretty good language, and uh, and I heard there's a new language called R is getting getting the uh, strength right now. Uh, and vi vi visual things, you know, this uh, visual basic should, should do the job too. You know, I, I do okay, visual so, basic for some other purpose, but I, I'll do a test. I'll, I'll check with you. It should be okay. And I okay, see. Okay, so both of them, both of them accommodate multiple languages. Okay. Yeah. 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 Because you know they, they want to attract the more people to use them, so they, they cannot force people, you know, who who are used to some kind of language to 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 suddenly change. But Python is getting very popular. Python is getting very popular. Um, okay, Frank. Oh, thank you. You know, I I mentioned GPS. Uh, Frank, uh, Mr. Jobe is our GPS uh, expert. Uh, that uh, oh, so is the jet coming into Fullerton, and what is the guy doing over Hollywood? Yeah, yeah. You see, that's the fun of it. It's okay. Sometimes I saw they all fly in the line. Maybe wrong and or, or Miss Barnes can help. They fly in a certain pattern, uh, and uh, then at night there's no plane. You know, I don't know if it's my signal too low or something like that. But but interesting. But I don't follow that all the time. But when you see that sometimes, hey, suddenly there's a helicopter showing up, and uh, this uh, and also small jet. This is our ISS Mimic. 
It's a scale model of space stations. It replicates in real time. Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, yeah, friend, we'll talk more because uh, I'm doing something with GPS. I'll check with you. So can the Pi connect to Chromebooks? To to the punch. Hello? <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm trying to answer the question so we can okay, move on. To, uh, that one. Okay. So uh, can the Pi connect to Chromebook? Yeah, yeah, it can connect to any computer um, that has, I think most important is USB, uh, you know, for, for uh, various, so they all use USB, but I, I can tell you the new boards, you know, that have uh, even put the PCIe, you know, or, or the, the S, SSD card, like uh, eMMC, or, or the, uh, uh, the the M2, you know, so the, the, they are getting a lot of things coming out. So it, it's, uh, I think Raspberry Pi is feeling the heat right now. And another thing is Raspberry Pi is uh, a proprietary. Yeah, if I'm correct, it's a proprietary, Leon can, Leon can correct me. Is they, they are kind of a, a pro, proprietary and the Arduino is more open source. So uh, you can see something they, they claim to be, you know, Arduino compatible. Uh, you know, even put uh, easily, but Raspberry Pi, you see a lot of, you know, the competitors. Yeah, the, hard the hardware side is proprietary, uh, particularly um, it's a, uh, it's created by Broadcom, essentially, was the, the founder of it, uh, even Upton in Cambridge University created it. And um, so that's why there are some knockoffs of it. But uh, really with uh, it, there must be more than 40 million of them now. I, I haven't kept track of how many are out there right now. So it's, uh, it's not uh, a problem uh, as far as I'm concerned that it is not an open source hardware. Um, and uh, it hasn't been a barrier to, to its adoption or use. And in fact, in many ways, it may have helped it in some ways uh, by uh, being that particular way. But it doesn't stop it uh, being a great platform for open source uh, project development, and particularly uh, the the fact that it's got the GPIO, and then companies can build whatever uh, hats, as they're called, or shields to go on top of those. Uh, you know, there's a vast array of things that you can do with them, and uh, I'll be sharing a little bit more about some of those uh, the the range of things that are being done. Uh, with this in regards to aerospace uh, when I get to my little bit of the presentation later on. Yeah, thank you, Leon. I, I'm very mm. inspired by you and also uh, by, by, you know, a few years ago, so I saw some folks end up with doing something. I, I also got very inspired, uh, you know, so, you know, I'm very happy to share it here. So, yeah, I have much more, you know, it's just a score. We can help us support a specific uh, outreach uh, classroom or, 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 you know, you know, any specific, any, but well, this is for general purpose, you know, the, no specific, uh, but anyway, so uh, a CTE teacher is saying I'll be missing. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, well, uh, at this point, my part will be posted, I think uh, the next two speaker too, um, uh, but not Vivian though, Vivian, uh, because, you know, you, you understand that it's a uh, uh, school. So uh, her, her part, her video will not be posted. Okay, so Frank, yeah, of course, you know, I've been thinking, you know, I, I have got some nice gadget, uh, GNSS, uh, GPS, you know, saying I, I, I will chat with you, you know, it's fun. Okay, so I think we, about time. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. I, I feel so excited. So I, I, I want to share this with you. So yeah, uh, finally, so many years, I really feel the, really appreciate this great opportunity. Uh, so let's uh, uh, move on to um, uh, Urban. So let's see. Um, okay. Hey, great. Ken? Yes, great. Go ahead. Yes, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Urban Huang. I am the chair of Orange County IEEE. And before that, I used to work in technical support, uh, which was purely by phone only. We used to work via WebExes, uh, looking onto customer computers. And I handle robotic process automation, uh, which is what I'm really going to show you today. Unlike um, Vivian and um, IIS above, I am not an entrepreneur, and I had a Raspberry Pi 4. Uh, you can see it here on the screen here. I bought a fun little case for it, put some stickers on it. Um, I wasn't able to build any kind of 
full blown, super cool application. You know, I kind of played around with it. Uh, I definitely broke it quite a few times, just changing options here and there, which I'm going to point out to you today. Uh, but really, I'm going to show you uh, what robotic process automation is, because it's kind of a newer trend <clears throat> in enterprise software and even software in general, where any kind of process you have on the computer that follows a pattern, you know, and um, perhaps as aerospace engineers, you might not have document-focused workflows as business users, where they have to go to a website, download a report, you know, maybe analyze something in the report and then go and place it in a folder. And maybe they have to do that at certain times or based upon certain conditions, um, like other customers or something like that. Uh, but for that, that's something where you would use robotic process automation. However, there are other uses for it I'm gonna show you today. <clears throat> um, again, I know I plan to talk about the Raspberry Pi, uh, which I will kind of touch upon that. I bought the Raspberry Pi 4 with eight gigabytes. And as soon as I loaded it up and I started using it, uh, you can see here, I am SSH'd into it right now. I realized that trying to use all eight gigabytes is actually really difficult. Um, in fact, even if I just run Chromium on it, it doesn't matter how much RAM you have. It's really the processor that's the bottleneck to um, loading things like YouTube and stuff like that. I will show you by going into my Raspberry Pi via VNC. And again, I just kind of want to stress this. I, I saw Vivian's presentation. I'm sure, you know, um, uh, ISS Bub is going to be really cool from Liam. These people seem like entrepreneurs. Whatever errors they encountered along the way, um, there must have been numerous because just playing around with the Raspberry Pi, I was able to break it just by changing a setting here or there, you know? And to me, that's kind of what differentiates this tiny computer from uh, Windows or Mac or even more mainstream versions of Linux is that uh, it's pretty hard to break these things, these operating systems, by changing something. But within the Raspberry, Raspberry Pi OS, um, I can break things very quickly um, just by changing the thing here or there. And I think that's kind of what really prevents us from getting big. I really would like to see everyone have a Raspberry Pi just because it's fun to play with. Um, here, I am going to, hmm, I did want to see the stats here. So I will want to delete this. And again, I know this isn't as sexy, so to speak, as seeing a really cool demo. I just wanted to spend a few minutes sharing with you, hey, if you see all these cool presentations today and you go and get a Raspberry Pi 4, really don't be surprised if you see just kind of little quirks here and there that you wouldn't expect with a, a really mature software. Um, maybe like the simulation or modeling software that you guys even work. Uh, so I'm gonna do a new connect, new connection. I changed the host name. So I have a 4K screen right now. Uh, the Raspberry Pi 4 is actually the first generation that enables native 4K output. Um, how that works, though, here, here's the catch, though, if you're thinking, oh, great, you know, I can take a Raspberry Pi, I can, you know, have it running right next to my computer, and then when I want to, I'll just VNC in, and I'll get a nice, you know, 4K resolution. It seems like the, the resolution restriction of VNC viewer um, seems like it's either HD or the actual resolution of the Pi is stuck to HD. And let me show you what I mean. Um, so again, I'm kind of a Windows guy. I, I work with Mac as well. You know, there's a lot of resolution. There's a lot of ways you can change the display of what I'm seeing. For the Raspberry Pi, it is really just, um, let me see, where is it? So they give you this, you know, obviously when you first go into the Raspberry Pi, it's gonna say, hey, the host name is Raspberry Pi. The default password is Raspberry. You should change this, you know? So right away, I remember I mentioned this to a friend and I could tell he didn't use the Raspberry Pi because he said, oh, I've heard about people, you know, packing into a Raspberry Pi, you know, because people left the default password on. But right away, as soon as you SSH into the Raspberry Pi on default, 
there's a little message that'll come up saying you need to change your password. So I would consider it near impossible for anyone. I guess if you really don't like reading, you know, to just be like, let me just leave the default password on and have someone hack me. It's pretty easy to do the basics, change the host name, put a new password on. But let's say my resolution right now is um, this is such an HD resolution, but I have a 4K screen. What if I wanted to get 4K resolution? Just something basic, you know. I'm not trying to do sensors like Vivian or um, pull custom, uh, I guess, images from a satellite the way um, Liam's going to show us. Uh, I'm just trying to do something simple. I want to see YouTube in 4K on a Raspberry Pi, and I don't want to use my monitor. Uh, the Raspberry Pi has a micro HDMI connector. That means you need a special connector to be able to connect that to your HDMI screen. But like Liam said, I think the real purpose of this is to run it headless. Um, when I did work with customers who use Linux in the enterprise settings, a lot of times they're running CentOS 6, 7, they're running headless systems. And if you are a Windows person and you don't have really any experience with headless systems, that's where I think the real value of the Raspberry Pi comes in because it's pretty fun um, in this sense doing things like, oh, let me see if there's any updates. And I'm just going to go like this. And as a Windows guy, I go to updates. I click get updates. And, you know, it just shows me what updates. And I click yes. And on Mac, it's even easier. You know, you just click update. It tells you the version. You click OK. With the Raspberry Pi and I guess Linux, is the fact that you have to do a pseudo APT update. Like, for me, the first person, like, I'm like, why can't I just type in upgrade? You know, and it just upgrades it. But I guess with Linux, this is the way the Unix system is built. Um, and I will say that, so also I'm not a Linux guy. I don't know what the difference is between uh, update and full upgrade. Like to me, I guess as a, as a Windows Mac person, it's like, why wouldn't the update just have both of them? Why do I need to do an update and a full upgrade? But Perhaps another Linux person can come in and correct and tell me why I need to do two of them and not just one of them. Um, but yeah, these are just kind of my thoughts. Do you want me to That's jump in on that? Yeah, Liam. Yeah, yeah. So uh, <laughs> yeah, it really does take a bit to to break the learning curve of Linux and sort of get get in there. But you're doing a great job. I mean, you're you're doing uh, good work just with you know the way that you're learning through it right now. So so no problems with the way you are. I was a Windows guy seven years ago before I took on doing ISS Above. So ISS Above was my first project in this world of Linux development. Uh, just to let you know, the update and versus upgrade is um, update, basically updates all of the uh, package repositories that are, sounds, uh, that are behind the scenes in Linux that is running all of the systems. So there's a way in which when you install new products and new packages, it pulls from this uh, uh, sort of public source available uh, packages to, to get things onto your system. The upgrade actually does a full upgrade of your operating system and firmware on your Raspberry Pi. And I can tell you, I never want them to be the same thing because it will break IS that it'll break some systems. Because when you do a full operating system and firmware update, you can find that some of your code no longer works. So there's a process that as a developer, I would go through in order to make sure that all of my code is working with a full upgrade. Um, so that's why they are separated out. There are, there are times when just what you want to do is update the packages, but not update the underlying operating system. I hope that, that sort of uh, uh, helps explain that. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's no, not, that definitely helps. Yeah, I, <laughs> yeah it's sort of like uh, doing an upgrade is like going from Windows 9 to window, Windows 8 to Windows 10. Um, doing, doing an update is like doing a, um, a regular, almost a regular Windows update that happens, you know, frequently, oftentimes at times when you don't want it to happen. Um, so, so that's really the difference between the two. And, uh, and yeah, when you're showing it all being done using the, 
the SSH interface where you're, you know, in dialing in, you know, you're you're using a terminal emulator. A lot of that can be done, obviously, using the desktop mode. Um, and by the way, that's why you're having trouble. Yeah, VNC is not a good way to do 4K from the Raspberry Pi. You really do need to have it plugged into a um, to a 4K monitor externally, and then you know you'll you'll be able to use it in full 4K mode uh, at that point. But VNC because uh, it's essentially doing a, a screen grab um, over IP, it, uh, it, you'll find that there are limitations with the way that that works. Wow. Yeah, yeah you definitely sound like a subject matter expert. <laughs> <laughs> it's sort of, it, it may seem that way. I can promise you, I've, uh, yeah, uh, I've broken you know, more Raspberry Pis than I care to, care to mention, which is why one of the best things about this is that just duplicate that micro SD card um, and you know you break something you just simply rewrite the card again it takes five minutes and you're back up and running so you know just have a stack of uh, micro SD cards and and handle it that way <laughs> at least the, that's the way that I've done it so I've, I've got plenty of skeletons in my closet it's a it's a badge of honor if you've broken your Raspberry Pi good on you it means that you're a, you're you're trying things out <laughs> yeah it's funny you mentioned that. I, <clears throat> as a kid, I, um, back when we had um, like Netgear Linksys routers back in the early 2000s, they primarily used Broadcom chipsets. Also, Atheros, I believe, was the, the main two ones. And they released a Linux version, uh, the WRT54GL. Um, and with that Linux version of this router, you could throw a custom firmware on there. And I remember as a kid thinking to myself, well, why would I want to put a custom firmware on this? you know, this router, you know, and I remember seeing all the options. You could change themes, you know, the graphs, there was more data, and it, it kind of made you seem cool, like a like a geek, you know. So I went ahead and did that. I flashed my own <laughs> firmware, you know, and it, I didn't really think much of it, you know, for a couple of years up until now when I realized, you know, most business users that I used to work with, you know, were business users. If I say the word firmware, right away they're like, what, you know, what, what is that? You know, what, what is this in relation to my problem? Yeah. I guess it's different because as a, as a customer support engineer, I'm directly looking at the problem. Um, perhaps in, I guess, in aerospace companies, your problems are larger. You know, you probably have like more discussions with fellow engineers, on team reviews and whatnot. I'm not sure it's quite so customer facing. Um, but the issue is still the same is that I came in with expectations, you know, just from going to the Raspberry Pi side and, oh, wow, you know, this thing can do 4K. I actually ran it in 4K and, um, you know, I was just playing YouTube. I had it right next to the router and it seemed a little like choppy, you know, and I was just kind of like, well, I guess I'm thinking of this the wrong way. Uh, in my picture, you can see I'm running a six core, 12 thread, you know, uh, 4.2 gigahertz, 32 gigabyte PCIe <laughs> Gen 4 desktop. You know, that thing will crush the Raspberry Pi the mm -hmm. power. But I thought about the power consumption, you know, I'm using like a 650 watt power supply you know, with a GPU in there. This Raspberry Pi consumes, from what I believe, three amps, five watts. That's a lot less than, than these machines, you know. And I realize the real value is what you and Vivian have done, is created like these specific applications on them that utilize the low memory, the low PowerPoint, um, you know, I guess the, the unique advantages of the Raspberry Pi. And, yeah, low cost. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. In the end, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and, and that's part of what, what I'll get into with my ISS above, you know, uh, someone just, they don't have to dedicate a, an expensive computer to display all of this rich information and live video from the space station. They just, uh, that you can get it with a $35 computer, download my image within five minutes. You've just got a dedicated little thing that's just sitting out there doing what it was designed to do. Um, you know, doesn't do other things in that mode. Uh, if you want it to do something else, you take the micro SD card out and put a, put another one in. You know, you're basically replacing the hard drive with something that allows it to be something else whenever you want to do yeah, that. It's, so it's technically hot swappable. And that's yeah, the part. <laughs> almost, um, yeah, you do have to shut it down. Don't, don't pull out yeah. that micro SD card. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess, I guess not hot swappable. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I should. Take my words back. Um, but let me just kind of show people, I, this is kind of a little ugly, I guess, but I mentioned the VNC thing, because here's the thing. So one of the cool things about the Raspberry Pi 
is that again, with all these operating systems out there, one of them's called RetroPie. Um, I do have the Raspberry Pi imager, so I can pull that up. This is the, um, before you had to download the ISO yourself, you had to use a, a ISO writer program. I think the most common one is Baylina Etcher, and you would do that. And you can still do that, I believe, for like the Nano um, that don't have the dedicated installer. And Raspberry Pi went ahead and made one. So now, this is cool because I just started using this in the last year. You can pick which one. I have um, Ubuntu desktop on this one, but they definitely make it a lot easier for people because now you can just, you know, you can see the date of everything. It's, it just makes it more easier, I think, for the general public um, to get in. You know, obviously, if you're a very tech savvy and you had a flash ISO yourself, you wouldn't need any of this. But uh, for me, like I went ahead and I tried out RetroPie. And I was super disappointed to realize that RetroPie, you, it only outputs um, with a cable. So that means I would have to dedicate a monitor to it just for it. And again, I was kind of hoping like, oh, I could, you know, use VNC and see 4K. Um, but again, I guess I, from what Leon's been telling me, VNC is not meant for 4K, it's meant for a screen grab. Um, so again, native 4K resolution would be, you take your 4K monitor and you plug it with that special cable into the Raspberry Pi 4. Um, I, I don't have RetroPie on me. I played around with it a little bit. I was kind of hoping it would be like, you go into this operating system and you can choose what game you want to play. But the reality is you have to get the ROMs yourself and then you have to load them yourself. Um, so I guess kind of reality yeah, that's, there. That's not as simple to, as just, that's yeah. to do with copyright. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's yeah. copyright yeah. On, the, on the game images. Uh, uh, some people tried to package it up so that you had all of the the games ready done, but they then run afoul of uh, copyright laws by doing that. So, that's, yeah, I, uh, I saw yeah. that, and I I realized it would definitely be wrong to try to make money off of something off of someone else's work, essentially, you know. But I I went on Etsy. Um, it's funny. Let me show you what. So I was looking at cases for the Raspberry Pi, and it's actually a pretty big market here on Etsy. Um, people here are creating all kinds of cool stuff. So you can go on Amazon, you can buy something, you know, but they also have these really cool, usually, you know, 3D printer created ones where you can go and be like, oh, I want this color. I want it to look like this. And this, I guess, ecosystem all sprung up just because of the sheer number of people with Raspberry Pis. Um, and I know Ken mentioned this before, but it is a lot um, cheaper building and messing around with a Raspberry Pi accessories included than going on and, you know, buying a full blown PC, you know, with GPUs that are out of stock, you know, everything's very big, takes up a lot of space, a lot of power. Um, I think for just, if anyone wanted to learn Linux, but they wanted a fun, transformable computer that's more accessible in my opinion, than an FPGA. You know, you can get an FPGA board, download the software, you know, the drivers, get the environment set up, run, you know, go through documentation to set up a simple application, or you can get this general purpose, you know, small computer, you know, $75 for eight gigabytes of DDR4 memory, which just by itself retails for at least $35, $40 on Amazon for DDR4 memory. Um, this one I know uses, they use micron memory. So that's pretty pretty high end stuff, you know. It's they're not using cheapo random memory. It's it's name brand stuff. And one of the cool things I realized when I thought to myself, why did I pay for an eight gigabyte board if I'm running Chromium, you know, on my you know with YouTube and it's only consuming barely more than one gigabyte. You know, I couldn't find a usage for eight gigabytes. And then I kind of you know to, to me it felt like kind of a waste. You know, so I would say to anyone out there thinking about purchasing a Raspberry Pi. You don't necessarily need the eight gigabyte version. You know, I know it's sometimes you think more is better, you know, like you're future proofing yourself. But I would say unless you're writing very like you're specifically thinking about AI, I've heard that can actually use all eight gigabytes of memory. I would recommend the four gigabyte is more than enough. You know, don't forget that the three and two, I believe they ship with two and four gigabytes. I'm not sure the exact configuration, but it was two um, for you know a brief while of time. It increased uh, Four in the gen Pi generation four, and then they added they added the option for eight gigabytes later on. Um, but I have that eight gigabyte one. It feels cool to have the you know the newest, hottest Raspberry Pi. 
but I can definitely say after seeing Vivian's and uh, eventually seeing Liam's presentation, it's what you do with it that really matters. Um, before I, I know you've just seen pictures of stuff and just kind of seen the Raspberry Pi desktop. I'm gonna show you RPA really quick. Um, I wanted to put it on the Raspberry Pi, but as I was doing that, I got an error and I realized the Raspberry Pi runs on an ARM processor and my old company software only runs on x86 Intel processors. So it's a no-go. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you this running on Windows. Um, you can go ahead and get a free trial here if you really wanted to see it. Again, I don't work for this company anymore. I get nothing from you downloading this trial. I am not trying to sell you this product. You know, this is just a trial. I Realistically, this is meant for companies. You know, it's not for a single person to use. Uh, I, again, I just show this off because I happen to know. So it consists of a robo server, which is a JVM. Uh, it has an API. It runs on port 5080. I would pull up the system diagram for you, but I just want you to know that this is a server. Um, it, is, it resides on your own computer. It starts up via an EXE, so it's locally, you know, local local server, not cloud-based or anything like that. And there's a design suite. Well, sorry, this is a development database. So this starts up a database I can use with it. In case I don't have my own database, say I'm just the average user, I just downloaded this. I don't have Microsoft SQL, MySQL, NoSQL, whatever stuff that you know developers use. So I start that development database up. I started up my robo server. I'm gonna go into design studios. And um, one thing I've been thinking about lately is the NVIDIA 3060 is going to drop on February 25 in five days at a price supposedly of $369 retail. Obviously, they are going to sell out within minutes, probably seconds of being released because of people using bots, scalpers using bots to purchase these GPUs due to you know, cryptocurrency mining right now. And just in general, the, the new GPU power and the value proposition they offer um, they get bought out in minutes by people using bots. So today I kind of want to show you what a bot is. Um, I know you think of bots as like these malicious things, but they're not quite, you know, again, they can automate documents and do stuff like that. Today I'm going to try to show you uh, what I showed Ken before, which is um, say I wanted to, let's go over here, like this one here. Let's say this graphics card, um, was something I wanted and it's out of stock. Now I can say, hmm, they used to have an option where it would say, you know, email me when this comes back. And I put my email in there one time thinking I would, you know, not thinking much of it. And it actually sent me an email saying it came back in stock. Now obviously I don't check my email all the time. So by the time I checked it, it was quickly out of stock again. So what I really need is for something to check this on a continual basis and let me know as soon as possible, hey, this is available so that I can be ready to purchase this as soon as possible. If not even automate the purchasing process uh, like these people with bots are doing so that I can actually get my hands on one of these. So I'm gonna take this link and I'm gonna go back to my design studio and I'm gonna say Newegg GPU Checker. It's gonna be the name of my robot. And this is a web-based bot. There are other companies like UiPath, Automation Anywhere, I don't know if they are as web-based as, um, as Kofax is, Kofax RPA. They tend to do more, I believe, desktop automation stuff, which is like clicking actual tabs and buttons and anything you see in a desktop, that can also be automated as well using UI elements. But uh, I'm not gonna be talking about that today. I'm purely talking about automating web-based processes. So I'm gonna put that link in there. Um, there it is. Browser engine, yep. And I am going to see, so right away I get a problem. If you downloaded the software, for some reason, you didn't see you know, what I just showed you today, you would put your URL there and you'd get a problem and it would say, Tari cannot re-reach, I'm gonna go all the end, SSL handshake error. And you're gonna think to yourself, well, what do I do? You know, where do I, okay. So since I know this product, I'm gonna go in, I am going to configure this. And for some odd reason, this product is set to TLS 1.0 default. That is super, super insecure. It's not even used anymore. By default, it's TLS 1.2. So I'm gonna to switch to that. This out of the way. 
I'm going to hit OK. And let's see if it can load it. So it actually was able to load it. It wasn't able to load the picture, but it was able to load the page. So now I'm going to see if I can extract this into a variable text new variable um let's do status i'm gonna hit okay out of stock okay so now i want to insert step four output let's see let's write a log that's easy. We're going to write a status. And now, so most uh, automation programs nowadays have some kind of, they, so they have a studio program. I swear every company uses the word studio in the actual <clears throat> name. And this is where you pretty much say you put your process in to predefine blocks. Um, this is assuming that you already know your process and you're not just kind of making it up as you're going along like me. Um, typically, you know, users would be like, oh, we need to take this model, place it into this folder. After the team reviews it, they're going to, I don't know, send comments on it, and then those will be in an Excel file. Again, I, I can't predict everyone's uh, situation, but it's going to be similar in that sense of you already know your process. Since I don't, I am going to write the log, and then this is the debug part where you will see that it says, out of stock. Now, pretend, you know, traditionally what I would do is I would go to this page and I would check it every couple of minutes, hoping that, hey, maybe if I get lucky, it'll be in stock and I can just buy it really quick. That is wishful thinking. Um, again, with the advent of bots and the lack of really strong capture protection in everyday online purchases, not just, you know, the weird ones that trip stuff up, uh, it's actually quite possible for people to automate buying things on Amazon. Um, I'm going to show you new egg to go back over here. Um, so say I have this bot that checks for me, right? I want it to write me a log and I'm going to have it action step. I'm going to loop this to a repeat. And I'm going to insert a step afterwards. And then after it repeats, I'm going to have it wait. Let me see, where is wait? I'm going to have it wait three seconds. And then I want it to check again. Loop, next. Now if I go and hit this. So this is what um, the purpose of RPA is, is to turn business users into kind of like, I wouldn't say app developers, but something to where they can take a process and be able to automate that themselves without having to speak to a developer, without having to, you know, basically tell someone else, this is what I want. To be able to do it yourself with something that kind of takes a while to learn, but hopefully you have good technical support or, you know, good documentation. Uh, something that, yes, I can do this in Python, you know, but how long would it take me to know how much Python would I need to know? Is learning Python essential for my industry slash career? Um, I find tools much easier to use. Again, I guess I shouldn't bash on Python. It just seems to me like no code slash low code is one trend of the future because sometimes if you don't need to learn the exact schematics of code, why should I? You know, for the Raspberry Pi, Yes, I had to learn some Linux command, you know, but if you're telling me I have to go in there and modify certain variables in order to get my system settings to work, that might be a little much, you know? Um, and I think that's kind of intimidating. Uh, with this kind of tool, I guess it's, I just think it's cool because now, again, I don't have to write a Python script. I can just use this. This is just an example. Now I am going to upload this to the web UI. So I'm going to go ahead, save changes, uh, management console. These are all just kind of the way it's organized. So I'm going to go ahead and upload. It technically integrates with GitHub, so you can have commits every time. I haven't integrated that one yet. But we are going to do it here. So this is the web <clears throat> uh, GUI where you can basically manage your RPA server. So you can see my server here, and it even has the port and what's running on, the IP address, version, 
CREs is our version of processing power. I shouldn't say R, is the number to measure processing power. In this case, it stands for concurrent robot execution, which means how many robots can you run at one time? With your trial license, you would be able to run one robot at a time. Uh, I have here my old developer license for my company, so that's why I'm able to have five here. Um, but some more general general basics. Uh, each server starts out as a two gigabyte JVM process, uh, expandable up to, I believe, eight or six. I'm going to check those messages. There's anything here. Okay. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing my screen. Does anyone have any questions? Yeah, everyone, this is a great opportunity. Uh, everyone, is expert. everyone is expert in this. And this is actually, you can find actually many very interesting use of this. It's a very interesting robot. Uh, you know, uh, this, so this uh, uh, certainly is, uh, have great, very great potential as, as you see more and more complicated, you know, um, you know, Windows, you know, all, uh, Mac iOS coming up, you know, this thing. Uh, is coming to play a very important role in business and also in uh, hobby or in uh, uh, home home you know usage or or education. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I agree, Ken. It's to me, it's kind of like one of the tools. You know, I don't <clears throat> plan on using this every single day, but to me, it's like if I can automate something in my life that I used to do, checking whether a product is in stock constantly and something can do that for me. And if I have the means and ability to set that up with tutorials available online, you know, I think that's a great option for, for entrepreneurs today. You know, like people like Vivian and Liam can go and create, you know, their own products based on off the shelf parts that are available for everyone. Now I know Kofax RPA isn't like the Raspberry Pi where you can go and buy it. Um, I just wanted people to see it so that in the future, in five to 10 years, when you have robots on your actual desktop computer that are perhaps triggered by events or keys, you know, then you kind of see a more human robot collaboration that's less Jetson y, that's less, you know, the giant six wheel, you know, the, the giant arms making cars and stuff like that. You're not going to see that for an office worker, you know, but for us, people that work with computers, um, you know, processes on a computer, they can be automated, you know, that's what we're seeing with AI is that you have AI that automates stuff for you, you know, but on the way to AI is you start automating all the stuff you can yourself. Um, and I think of Kofax RPA as one way to do that. Um, thank you, everyone, for letting me share. Uh, I also you... want to... All right, Sorry. Mike has a question in the Q&A box. Oh, okay. Can, can you see it? Am I reading that? Um, do you mind just reading the question to me? It might be easier. Oh, okay. Does Power BI do similar automation? Uh, yes. Yeah. So Power BI is the business intelligence software from Microsoft. They do um, more analytics, uh, but Microsoft has a automation platform called Power Automate. That one is block based. It's similar to the to the studio I showed over here. Um, but it's much prettier. You know, Microsoft obviously made the update little office bar here. It looks a lot prettier. From when I first downloaded it and played around with it, I could not find a usage for it as the average person. Everything was very office centric. You know, download from Drive and put to Outlook. Connect Word to, you know, one of their other services. Um, I, again, I think it's great that they're offering that there. That's their, um, I guess, their, their product. And they also bought Soft Motive. Uh, which was a Kofax competitor, an RPA based in the United Kingdom. So they definitely plan to do more of this. Um, but you are going to see a trend again where business people are going to be getting block based software to build stuff. And you'll have less of a, hey, Mr. Developer, can you build this for me kind of thing, um, which should hopefully we get better apps from that. Um, I do you want to close off my presentation? This is kind of random. I thought to myself, one of the, why do I have eight gigabytes? You can mount a virtual disk on memory and then you can 
copy your Chromium browser cache. I've done that in my Windows computer to that memory because I found out the write speed of memory is incredibly, incredibly fast. I believe online it's stated theoretically upwards of like 25 gigabytes a second for DDR4. Um, that beats uh, SSD PCI Gen 4 right now. I have a drive in my computer that's rated at max, I believe, five gigabytes right. I have yet to achieve that, but that's what the maximum is. With memory, which is even closer to the processor, if you have a lot of that stuff, traditionally, you know, you just kind of let it sit there. That's what I did before. But now we're in this era, I feel like, where you want to utilize every single silicon you have. You know, you turn your Raspberry Pi into a home router, a gaming station, a, a project that you can turn into, a, like, share with other people. Again, like Vivian Liam's projects. Um, for me, the thing is, but I found out you can, again, if you mount a hard disk on your available memory, which for the eight gigabyte Raspberry Pi, you can put a four gigabyte drive easily that runs on hyper, hyper fast DDR4 memory. Um, again, I don't have the, the speeds here because I broke my Raspberry Pi and it didn't have a script on it, um, but I was getting upwards of at least 733 megabytes write, read and write for file. Um, I don't know about read and write, but I think one of them was read uh, or write, um, but it's very, very fast running things off the memory. So I do want to leave that note on there. If you do mess with the Raspberry Pi and you do get the eight gigabyte version, do use that memory as a virtual hard disk. You know, you can speed up applications a lot quicker. Uh, thank you for your time. And I hope we are going to get a great presentation from Liam. I'm going to go ahead. And... Well, thank, thank you so much. This is fantastic. This is amazing. Uh, so let me see, is any, um, so if there's no further questions, so uh, everyone, this is fantastic. So stay with us. So uh, anytime, you know, if you'd like to present anything, uh, uh, let us know. Uh, we're happy to uh, uh, to arrange for you. Oh, oh, definitely. Thank you, Ken. Uh, do you want to do the drawing right now, Raffo? Um, sure, sure. I'm not sure how I can help with that, but yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so the raffle, um, typically, I think what we do is from the attendee because, you know, and uh, uh, maybe you can uh, kind of have, uh, you know, um, I probably, I don't, I think you have time for quiz, but, you know, you can it, it probably take that, but I think you have enough, right? You have enough to give a give away. So, so I, I can see almost, uh, uh, you know, that there's uh, we have people actually, I'm not speaking, we can send everyone each of them one of them <laughs> so even you know, without that sure i'm not sure there are 20 boards ken i there could be less i, I don't i'm really not yes. sure if there are 20 boards e exactly uh, 20. oh wow okay <laughs> well um heads up to everyone these boards were used um they're donated by boston bites again they are a robotics school based out of irvine so these are used i believe primarily raspberry pi 2s that means they have two gigabytes of memory. They are verified working, but all of them work. Um, some of them might not have Wi-Fi working. If so, they might have a, a label or something like that on them. But for the most part, these are these are your older generation Raspberry Pi. 2s. Yeah, let, let me jump I, in there. Uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Raspberry Pi twos are pretty old Pis. They won't have built-in Wi-Fi, and they will have, I think, one gigabyte uh, of RAM. So yeah, they're, they're very old versions of Pies. Good thing is ISS Above will work on it just fine. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, I guess I don't need to do anything then for the raffle, right? Can we have enough for all the, but yeah. I would say that you, there were more attendees in the beginning. I believe there yeah. were around 20. Yeah, they yeah. double, you know, double, I, double the, the amount of people, yeah. yeah I, Maybe you can use a random number generator uh, or do something afterwards. It might take a while to raffle off, you know, 20 okay. boards. Okay. Um, yeah. So, mm -hmm. Well, I don't know if you want to give out all 20 or you want to give some of them. Yeah. I was... I, again, I, I probably not all 20. Maybe okay. we can do like 15. And that, at least, okay. that would mean you have a 50% chance of winning a Raspberry Pi 2. Um, okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, okay, yeah, then, then, we, then that, we do it afterwards. Yeah. I understand, do it, we do it afterwards. I, I see what it means, not right here, I understand. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Excellent. So, uh, 
if you yeah you, you're welcome to stay and jump in and, and or just like a discussion with uh, Niam's uh, presentation so uh, stay it's, it's very it's fascinating so uh, yeah, yeah so, no I I want to see I have to bond. okay so Liam, it looks like the, the show is coming up uh, is the, the big show to today uh, so let me see I, I have the, the I have an introduction uh, uh, so I, uh, although you are really well known, but uh, let me still quickly. Okay, so where is the... So everyone, so that, uh, uh, so our next speaker is Mr. Leon Kennedy. Uh, he's the inventor of the ISS above. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, he invented the, uh, the, this uh, very nice inspiring gadget based on Raspberry Pi. He's a former president of Orange County Astronomers is a former Griffith Observatory Planetarium lecturer and is former NASA JPL Solar System ambassador. Uh, is, uh, the ISS above is a single board computer uh, device. Uh, Raspberry Pi uh, present a rich set of live information about the ISS, uh, including uh, live video views of the Earth. Uh, actually, Liam, the, 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 in the chat, there was a question that's saying if there's a, a device on ISS called the Earth Below. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I actually answered that one. Uh, okay, it, okay. it would become a home below. Yeah. Because home. an ISS above lets you know whenever the space station is above your home. Cool. And literally, if you transported that ISS above to the space station, and like an astronaut, most of their homes who are from the US would be in Houston. So every time it was passing by Houston, which is five to eight times every day, it would let them know home hmm. is below. Fantastic. Yeah, so what, what started was a weekend uh, project in 2013 to build cool uh, gizmo to inspire his own grandchildren. Uh, it's, now it's been shipped to more than uh, 3,500 locations around the world, including private homes, schools, science centers, and even at every NASA center national, nationwide. ISS above is one of the edu education, um, <clears throat> education part partners with the ISS National Lab. Uh, and receive a grant to support their use in 100 of schools uh, 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 schools across the USA. It's uh, just amazing. You can see the uh, more and more uh, significant role of ISS. Uh, that's uh, always fascinating, inspiring all the generations. So uh, let's welcome Mr. Uh, Liam Kennedy. Thank, uh, thank you so much, Ken, for that intro. Uh, very honored to be here again. And uh, just to let you know, I always try to make this happen, but it doesn't always work out. But right now, the International Space Station is passing over Los Angeles. So, uh, and I know this is the LA Las Vegas area. Uh, so <laughs> it is also passing over Las Vegas skies because it's so high up. Um, but this is actually one of my tracking screens uh, on the ISS above that's displaying where the space station is currently in our skies above us as it's passing by. And you'll see there's various bits of information there. It's showing it's still, it's 860 miles and getting closer with every second. And it tells you the altitude in terms of degrees above the horizon and the direction it's in. And you'll see it's actually passing a little bit to the north of us. And it will be passing over to, yeah, it finishes up in, in the uh, east-southeast uh, as it's heading a little bit closer over to Las Vegas. Um, anyhow, and just uh, if I switch that screen back to display me, I'll show you what my ISS above gizmo does. Um, while this is happening, because it wouldn't just be good enough if it was just displaying boring numbers like that. It needs to be more engaging than this. So uh, let me just show you what that would be doing. So um, this will also show the problem that Ken was having before. When you have a very bright LED in front of a camera, it rather blows out the, the screen and it's messing with my green screen here as well. But Remember who I initially created this for was my grandchildren. And my youngest grandson at that time was three. And, you know, having bright LEDs flash like this uh, is an eye catcher. Uh, you know, 
I used to be three years old myself, and I can I can remember going around science museums in England, where I was born I was born and raised in England. Um, you know, anything that flashed that got my attention. So that's what it's doing right now. So this is this little box is just letting you know the space station is above. So um, I'll let that uh, I'll let that do do its business there, and then. Uh, the other side of things that the my ISS above product does, and it is just a Raspberry Pi computer. Uh, seven years ago, it was running on this little device, uh, which is that Raspberry Pi Model B, uh, one of the first versions of the ISS above. It was a, a relatively slow um, uh, computer system, but it was good enough to uh, do all of the orbital calculations. Uh, so I wrote the code in Python. And in fact, what's happening behind me is this is live video from the cameras on the space station right now as it's passing over Nevada. There it is. Um, so that's the other thing that my ISS above does. It uh, automatically plays the live video feed that's available from the International Space Station. And this is from one particular camera that NASA has now dedicated to displaying live views of the Earth. It cannot move. It's permanently pointed down, uh, although they can zoom it. And occasionally, they do uh, zoom it to crop out that little part of the space station that's in the, the top right there. Um, but using this, uh, students or anyone who's inspired by views of the earth. In fact, that is just going over a part or it's going to be going over in the lower right. That's actually the beginning part of the Grand Canyon. I think that's one of the, the lakes. Probably some of you that know, uh, know those areas better than me would know what that is, but it's probably the lakes leading into the Hoover Dam. Um, yeah, the, the Grand Canyon is below some of those clouds there. And you'll see the other information where it's displaying the location information above. Um, the video feed is actually about, but it can be up to 30 seconds delayed from real time due to standard internet delays. So the position information I'm displaying is actually accurate to where it is at this very moment. So it may be a few uh, seconds ahead of what we're seeing here. But anyway, that, that was just a, a random opportunity there as the space station was passing by us. I thought that would be cool to bring that in. But believe it or not, I'm not going to be saying a lot more about the ISS above uh, in my presentation because I wanted to share a little bit more of what I've discovered as far as how uh, particularly Raspberry Pis are used in aerospace and also Arduinos. And I'll give some examples of, uh, of the kind of things that I've been working on there. So I'm gonna switch on, I'm gonna share my screen. Uh, excuse me a minute while I, I uh, sort of just mess around with this. I'm gonna share my whole screen and then I'm going to show my slides. Uh, that's just my intro slide. Um, so uh, let me bring up the chat so that I can perhaps see what's going on over there. All right, we'll see how that works. Um, so yeah, so you should be seeing the, the sort of just summary of what I'm gonna be uh, sharing today. Uh, I wanted to really cover that whole aspect of uh, where um, Arduinos and Raspberry Pis are used throughout the space and aerospace arena. And I, I'm sort of gonna cover this in this area. Uh, I'm going to talk about space-related applications that are used on the ground. ISS above is one example of that, space-related, but it's firmly planted on the ground. Then I'll cover some what I call near space, and this covers uh, uses of those uh, microcontrollers in high altitude balloon launches that go up to about 130,000 feet and also mid altitude balloon launches that reach about 30,000 feet. Um, then I'll get into suborbital. Oh, and looks like I've missed the final one there. So yeah, there are suborbital uses for pies and experimentation that goes on, uh, you know, New Shepard and, oh, there you go. I think I just uh, did a typo there. 
in space <laughs> version just got on the same line there. So there's plenty of examples of particularly Raspberry Pis um, on uh, space projects. So actually in space. So let me just start off. Uh, this was where I was planning to start off with the ISS above before it started passing us by. But yeah, this is this is the little box. Uh, if you would. You know, I'm not here to sell the ISS above. I'm here to tell you about it, just in in terms of uh, how it's used in uh, in education and how that relates to the topic here. But uh, the one I ship to schools is uh, a simple uh, pre-built device with that little Pi Glow LED unit. It's a Raspberry Pi Model Three. In fact, it's a Model Three B, not the Three B Plus. Uh, which is a, a because the, it gets a little bit too hot. I've discovered, you know, having shipped three and a half thousand of these over seven years, I I've really come to understand uh, how you have a reliable product that's going out to teachers and uh, other members of the public who are not necessarily tech, you know, all that tech savvy and don't need to be and don't want to be. So um, you know, this is this is my little box. And here are some screens that are shown. Uh, all of the all of the screens here. It's about tracking the space station and informing you about what's going on on the space station. Who is currently living up there? Uh, letting you know the next time you can run outside and see it. Um, and uh, I'll bring that up in in a short one as well, so you'll know when you can run outside and see it in the LA area. Um, just a, a little bit of context for where the ISS above has been displayed and viewed and used. Here's some examples of me uh, taking it to various exhibitions, make affairs. Uh, the big photo on the lower right, that is when students were speaking live with an astronaut on the space station. And this was in the Kennedy Space Center visitor complex. And uh, we had a, a, a live ham radio contact with an astronaut. All those students up there got to ask a question via ham radio. And behind them, you can see that we were tracking the space station using an, an ISS above. Um, this is, again, ground version of a space-related use. Uh, NASA decided that they wanted to see if my ISS above could light up a gigantic set of LEDs uh, that are on the one of the entrance to Johnson Space Center. So I actually created a custom little board that very neatly allowed uh, me to connect up to uh, a relay that was compatible with uh, a five volts. And it just simply switches on the relay whenever the space station is passing by Johnson Space Center. And that in the top left is the uh, is the photo of the actual unit um, sort of showing you that custom board that I put together. And, uh, and then below it, that's showing the diagram of what the, the, the gatehouse looks like. If any of you on here have ever been to Johnson Space Center, gate two is what's called the high volume um, uh, gate. It's where uh, employees can very quickly drive in and out. So it's not the primary visitor entrance where you might be more used to going through. It's just around the corner from that. Anyhow, uh, just some other places. Again, on the ground use, you'll find ISS above in libraries and uh, science centers. The one on the right there is at uh, the Museum of Science and Industry in Tampa, and they created a really great um, sort of display of that. But so let, let me now move on to some other uh, things that I've played around with. Uh, this thing here, uh, I just noticed someone says that they're not getting audio. I'm sure I'd have heard from someone before now. It, it's okay from my end. It okay. All right. Yeah. So that, that's a local issue with whoever CTE teacher is, I hope that could be fixed out. Um, what I wanted to show you here is a, a collection of, um, uh, so these are Arduino based uh, IS, uh, satellite trackers. I actually called these sat above. And um, so yeah, CTE teacher, I think everyone else can hear. So it's likely an issue with your uh, audio settings on Zoom. 
you might just want to go into the audio connection at the bottom left of the Zoom window and just check out your audio settings there. Hopefully you can fix that, uh, fix that out. Um, so yeah, so what I wanted to show you here is uh, these are some little ESP8266 devices that, uh, um, that I've put together at various times to track different satellites. Uh, the one on the top left is one that is uh, tracking the Planetary Society's light sail, which is their own CubeSat that is currently in space and uh, uh, has proven itself as far as uh, what, what it needed to do, which was prove that using only uh, photons of light, uh, it could keep its uh, orbit, it could increase the altitude of its orbit, which it did a minuscule amount, but it was enough to prove that they could do it. And then I've got some other satellites that I'm tracking there. Uh, the one in the top middle, that is OCO2, which is a satellite built and designed by uh, Jet Propulsion Lab. Um, and uh, just a, a little look inside the innards of one of these. Uh, the ESP8266 board I was using was very, very tiny, and it came with a built-in OLED display and uh, very inexpensive. I think it cost like $10. And the little LED unit there, which is a full RGB LED, I think I could buy them on a strip of 30 for for like 50 bucks. So uh, very inexpensive to put together. Uh, this is showing a slightly different version of them. Um, shows the you know battery that I, that I used inside there. And this one was repurposing um, a, a pin, a special badge that was produced by the ISS National Lab, otherwise known as CASIS, um, that I created for them. And uh, oh yeah, I just had to put this guy in. Uh, that's Bill Nye, the science guy in the offices of the Planetary Society, being impressed by light sail above little indicator there. Um, so moving on from ISS world, I wanted to share with you a few other things. Uh, this is more uh, informational than demonstrating, but I thought it was uh, worth knowing. Um, so this is showing an example of a set of NOAA satellites uh, called GOES, uh, GOES East and GOES West. This one is, uh, is the satellite GOES East. And there's a, a link there that shows you how you can view uh, all of these images live from the satellite. But the coolest thing, absolute coolest thing that you can do, uh, so this is via the web, but uh, with the right <laughs> equipment, you can uh, access that imagery live uh, using a Raspberry Pi and a special, um, uh, this is a, a software defined radio and a dongle. And uh, the link that I've got there, uh, and I'm sure uh, Ken will be able to post this presentation later, that link will take you to a full tutorial on how you can build your own GOES image downloader using a Raspberry Pi. Now, you know, many times the question is, why would you even bother when you just have bring up a browser and you can download this stuff? But I can tell you uh, some of the, the students who are using um, ISS Aboves now, I have a group of students in the Galapagos Islands, and they're very much interested in doing um, some work on sustainability and really being able to see what is going on in their own neighborhood in the islands. And, uh, you know, this would provide them the capacity to have in their school a completely independent device that doesn't need to be hooked up to the internet. And yet it's literally downloading um, live images of the weather across the Galapagos Islands. And uh, so that's, a, to me, a really exciting thing that you can do with these really inexpensive devices. And the, um, yeah, I agree with you. You talk about this, I, I really agree with you because a few years ago, I, I was inspired by others doing, and so I had one too. So you, you can download data directly from space. Oh, great. You know, that kind of thing, direct connection is, is uh, something that yeah. uh, is really, really, just like your mm. ISS above, is a direct connection to space that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. inspiring. But the thing for me is that for that, you know, you can build it as a, uh, a quarter flyer antenna. It took some effort. And mm -hmm. the thing, if you move, 
is a gradually I, I lost parts of something. You know, I'm trying, actually, I was intended to do the demo for that today, but the oh, problem wow. is that, okay. yeah, but, but the problem so is it's, uh, that, you know, it had to be outdoor, you know, so yes, I, I kind of, yes. <laughs> yeah, so next time we can do it together. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but, we'll have to come along. So in less COVID times, when we are allowed to that's right. gather, yeah. one of the one of the things that we were doing just before COVID hit is that we were setting up uh, at the monthly star party, the, the public star party at the Griffith Observatory. We had a, a satellite tent where we were tracking satellites, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, downloading images wow. as they were going by live. And it was something that truly astonished many yeah. of the 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 public who were passing by to really understand that uh, we were downloading images from satellites and communicating with them and some of those satellites were actually built by students um, we, uh, at UCLA at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo yeah. um, so it was really quite an extraordinary thing yeah good uh, uh, so, I have a question but uh, mm -hmm. I think there was a yeah, I agree. We do still have that. And I, I, I actually had trying to explore different antenna, other things, you know, just the, the pandemic. But the one thing I heard, because I was trying to do that, that's that's called alternate, alternate. I, I, it seems that it's a European. Uh, they put something, it's kind of, uh, you can, a lot of, you can, down, but I think they were, it's not out of business, but some could say shut down and uh, for some reason for a couple of years. And they said they will be back. Have you heard of anything about it? I have not. No. Okay. No. If you've heard um, anything, let me know. Yeah. Yeah. We'll do. We'll okay, do. Thank you. Thank you. So I I wanted to move along again. This is this is what I call near space. So this little gizmo is really quite extraordinary. It is designed by Bill Brown, who is a NASA engineer at Huntsville, Alabama, and um, I I don't have another picture of this. I don't think, but uh, this is showing a close up of the business end of this little. It's called we call it a Pico Sat. Um, it's an Arduino based uh, platform um, that comes pre configured basically. Uh, but all, all it does is it uh, when it launches up, it will transmit a whole set of telemetry, including its position because it has a built-in GPS, to um, a, a, a system called APRS, uh, which is a, a ham radio data packet system that is used by ham radio people to communicate information using the ham radio system. So, you know, I'm a ham radio certified person. You know, I have my, my ham radio, uh, uh, you know, headset uh, system and I can use that to communicate voice with other ham radio people um, but another way is this thing this gets attached to a small mylar balloon and and these have circumnavigated the world would you believe it uh, I did a, a system here with the YWCA in Pasadena while we were on COVID lockdown and uh, the students got to learn how they could track this how they could predict where it was going but really at the heart of it it was this little device it only cost a couple of hundred dollars and uh, uh bill brown basically uh, ships them out to you um uh you know as soon as he can make them but that's that's a cool example of it um uh, moving on this this is uh, another thing that i'm really inspired by it's called iss mimic and this is a project that was built by um, some Boeing staff who work on the ISS program at Johnson Space Center. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm gonna show you a little video um, of what this thing does, because it really is pretty inspiring. So stop share, gone back to me. Yes, it's still live video from the space station behind me, but I'm gonna to switch to another screen in just a minute. Uh, Forgive me for doing this. I'm going to switch you over to this, um, which is actually, oh, no, not that one. Uh, doo -doo -doo. All right, I'm getting there. Cool, we're there now. Um, so I'm going to play out a little video that is a demo of the ISS Mimic, and it's only a minute long, so uh, it will not take very long to, to go through it, but here we go. This is our ISS Mimic. It's a scale model of Space Station. It replicates in real time the configuration of Space Station. 
for receiving live telemetry from NASA. NASA does share some of that data publicly. We use the public data set. That microcontroller sends commands to motors embedded in the truss, which then turn the arrays. Since real time is slow, we can do playback at uh, 60 times speed. So normal orbit is, uh, is 90 minutes, but we could see that in 90 seconds. Our ISS Mimic project is also open source. That means that all the code that we've used is available and published to the web. One goal for this project is to engage students in the classroom. So our dream is that this open source published model would be available for any educator, any STEM enthusiast that wants to involve students, you know, middle school through college to engage in this. They can build their own. Students would learn coding. They would learn about mechatronics, motors interacting with electronic commands. They would learn about the physical aspect of connecting it all together, running wires. Um, then the physical build using 3D printing to 3D print the components. Those are all fantastic skills to build. Anyhow, <laughs> that's uh, that, that was just a, a, a quick, um, uh, intro to that to, to that project, which is really quite exceptional. Um, I, I should I should be able to post links to that project so that you can follow along with it. But one of the coolest things that it's really all about uh, to me that I just really loved is how the it actually combines the two worlds of Raspberry Pi with Arduino. The Raspberry Pi is actually the unit. And let me just bring up this thing here. The control interface and the display is all on this. This is what's called the Raspberry Pi touchscreen. And uh, this, uh, um, this is what they use to run their main code. But the actual actuators that are controlling that uh, uh, 1 100th scale model of the space station are all done using uh, Arduino. Uh, so it has servos, uh, stepper motors, um, so it's quite complex, I would say, to, to put together, but uh, really quite extraordinary how it is interfacing with the live telemetry uh, from the International Space Station that is uh, giving a whole load of information about where the solar panels are, uh, the power usage. It's really got over 300 um, telemetry points from the space station that it's tracking and it's all used to motorize the the ISS model and light up different uh, as different LEDs to indicate what's going on so it really is quite an extraordinary system um, so let me go back to oh before I before I switch away from this I have a couple of other videos that uh, that I will just play out behind me um, and if I switch that over to there, uh, you don't need that. Um, this was one of my uh, little projects that was tracking the space station. It's a, 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 a space station holiday wreath. And uh, just showing you using that ESP8266, I set up a holiday wreath with these LEDs. And uh, you know, every time the space station was passing by, this thing would switch on. And then uh, one other thing I'll show is let me just bring up this one. Yeah, this this one is uh, uh, was tra uh, was tracking the Hubble uh, satellite Hubble satellite, so it was uh, lighting up whenever the Hubble was passing by. Um, the Hubble is one of those satellites that's in a, a rather unusual orbit. It's sort of not quite geostationary. <laughs> at all, but it's much further out than many other low Earth satellites. So um, it actually stays above you for uh, maybe half a day, I think. I'm, I'm trying to remember what it is rather than, uh, anyway, that's, uh, that's just me. Let me, oh, just randomly, this is a pre-recorded video of the space station passing over Houston. So I thought I would just uh, leave that going there at the moment. Um, yeah, this is what the live video shows when it's going over uh, big uh, cities. This was a clear day, actually, I think in the end of October last year. But uh, it's uh, looking a little bit different over there at the moment with the, the cold snap that they have been suffering from. Anyhow, uh, back, to my, back to my presentation. Uh, you know, if there's any questions... 
that uh, that are coming up. Let me see. I don't see any in the Q and A, so uh, let me just reshare my screen and carry on. So here we go. Oh no, didn't mean from the beginning. From current slide. There we go. Here we go again. All right. So moving on. Um, so that was all near space. Uh, so it was from on the ground to near space. What I now wanted to go into is how the uh, Raspberry Pi is used in many cases on the International Space Station. This particular slide I've got going on here is highlighting um, an educational use of uh, Raspberry Pi. The photo on the right is showing um, this, this device that goes in the classroom, which is called Exolab. And Exolab is a, a plant uh, astrobiology um, experiment platform that allows students in the classroom to uh, follow along and grow the exact same plant um, in the classroom that is on the International Space Station. The photo on the top left is the space station version of, uh, of this particular um, uh, device. Uh, yeah, Space Tango, Magnitude IO, that's the right one. And in fact, that actual device that is being held up there was launched today on the Northrop Grumman um, C, uh, NG-15 that launched to the International Space Station earlier today. And this device gets plugged into a, a special uh, area on the Destiny Lab. And uh, a, a few days later, it'll start receiving telemetry, uh, sorry, uh, transmitting telemetry to the ground, which will be picked up by all of the exolabs that are around the world that are conducting the same experiment. Uh, so they see images, they see uh, data such as the CO2 levels, temperature, humidity, and uh, then they see images showing the, the growth of that particular uh, plant that is, that is up on the space station. So that's one area. Um, this was the, the thing that Ken mentioned earlier called the AstroPi. It was originally created by the Raspberry Pi Foundation, and for the first couple of years, it was run by them. They actually designed and built the, the, the very special housing there for the Raspberry Pi, which uh, had to be built in, or, uh, in order to make sure it's human certified for use inside the space station by astronauts. There's a very different requirement if you are running an experiment and it only needs to be housed inside an experiment rack to when astronauts uh, are you know, coming in contact with this day by day. So there's two of them up there. And there's an extraordinary program through now ESA. ESA, the European Space Agency, has now taken this on completely. And they run a program across Europe uh, which hopefully includes the UK still, um, across Europe where students can um, put their code through an approval process where, and it's a competition, where their code gets run on the International Space Station, and then they get the results afterwards. And each of these has a camera that can be attached. Uh, one of them is their uh, one without an IR filter, and one of them is uh, just a regular visible light camera and lots of different uh, options for students to work with them there. Um, no, honey. Oh, I think someone's unmuted there. We we're just hearing a, a interesting conversation. <laughs> anyway, all right, carrying on. Um, yes. uh, another, uh, another very, very interesting use that I discovered uh, of uh, a Raspberry Pi on the space station is this unusual project which on the face of it sounds, huh, you know, is that of any interest? Um, it's, it's a device that is on the International Space Station, which is paired with um, a science museum on the ground. And uh, people who are visiting that science museum get to interact in real time with the experiment that's on the space station. So uh, they apparently wear um, a, a pulse oximeter, 
that where that data is transmitted up to this experiment on in the Columbus module of the ISS and the kaleidoscope lights pulsate and change based around the, the, the telemetry that's being sent up from that pulse oximeter. So, and it's a, it was a, a very interesting experience for someone on the ground to really uh, understand that their pulse and their data for their heart rate um, and their oxygen level was impacting an experiment live on the space station. So that was pretty, uh, pretty amazing thing. Um, one more thing. So have Raspberry Pis been used on an actual satellite? And yes, they have. There are more and more uh, uses of these. This is an example of one that actually went up on a Soyuz rocket in July of 2019. And uh, this was a very simple Raspberry Pi Zero uh, connected up to a camera. Um, as you can see, they did encase it in a space grade uh, housing um, to be able to account for the, the wide temperature swings. And um, uh, that one was a very successful launch too. Um, yeah, so that's probably, I th I'm thinking that may be the end of, of most of my presentation. And uh, I haven't been tracking time. 12.52. So yeah, I'm a bit, of, bit ahead of time. So let me just stop the share by now. Uh, I'm just curious if there are any questions that have come up while I've been sharing, uh, sharing this. Um, so I'm open to questions and uh, anything you'd want, to, you'd want to ask me about any aspect of what I've shared. So I'm ready. <laughs> Uh, no, I did have a question, but I, I certainly forgot because one of the slides uh, about this uh, uh, hydroponics, I think a slide of that or behind that, uh, can you post that again? Sure. Uh, I think I, have, I, I was about to ask you, certainly forgot. Can you? Yeah, you sorry. know what I'm going to do? I'm going to bring up their website because that has the same information on it. Okay. And then I'll share, I'll share that particular page. Um, mm -hmm. And, but uh, one, one thing is definitely related to what you said using Raspberry Pi as a, uh, the actual satellite. I, I don't know that enough detail, but I, I think some of the uh, AIWS do that project. Uh, they, they use, uh, uh, they didn't mention very clearly, but, I, I, but based on what they were describing, they probably didn't have the budget to make a new board. So I, I kind of feel they're probably using Raspberry Pi or Arduino. You know, for mm -hmm. high altitude or their cube set. But then the thing is, you know, as you just said, you know, if you have to go into a space station or something, it has to be human grade or or like a hardened uh, device. So uh, do do yeah 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 this this is great. So kind of but but if you do this, um, how long can this survive with the thing off the shelf? You know, I think we talk from the store, we do something, serve it there how many months you can you know, sustain, you know? Yeah, so this particular experiment always stays inside the space station. Oh, okay. So it, yeah, so this particular one, um, it, uh, it just gets launched uh, in the pressurized part of, uh, for, for, for a Dragon resupply, it's in the pressurized part. Obviously the Northrop Grumman stuff, it's, it's all pressurized. So an astronauts just take it out and then slot it into the experiment uh, platform that is run by the implementation partner. Um, this is this is Space Tango. Um, just in case it's of interest, when uh, anyone, and I mean anyone who is listening here, can get their experiment onto the space station. Sometimes it takes money, but sometimes it takes looking out for the requests for proposals that come from the ISS National Lab, and in some cases directly from NASA. And uh, you can design and build your own experiment to go to the space station. But when you're on that pathway, if you're a commercial organization, like X Magnitude IO is a commercial education organization. So they work with one of the ISS National Labs implementation partners to design a space grade version of their experiment. It's not very complex to, um, to be able to create something that works inside the space station. Um, you know, there's some basic requirements for safety um, and, 
you know approaches like that but it's not quite the same as what you'd have to do to have a space grade um satellite launch and even those are done as well so the somewhat of an unknown thing uh, for many is that the space station is actually a place where cubesats are launched from so there have been hundreds that have been launched from the space station and there's a, a there's a, a satellite ejector that is um, built by Nanorax, which is one of the other uh, implementation partners for the space station. You work with them to design your satellite uh, or, you know, to get it uh, possible for them to launch it on your behalf. Um, there were some very early versions of Planet Labs um, uh, flocks of Earth viewing satellites that were launched. I can't remember if they're, they're doing it uh, using that approach anymore. Uh, I think uh, a lot of times they're launching on SpaceX rockets these days, but nevertheless, in the early days, they would design their CubeSat, their 3U, approximately 3U Earth viewing satellites to be launched from the space station. Um, and uh, yeah, this particular one, it, uh, it, it, it gets up on the space station, stays up there for about three months. And uh, the good thing is, is that the, the exo lab thing that's in the classroom um can uh connect with any future uh experiments that are launched to the space station so it's a one-time thing for, for that exo lab but uh, uh three or uh, usually two or three times a year magnitude io launches another experiment that students can work with in the classroom anyhow so uh let me stop that sharing i think there's uh, a question Oh yeah, good. In Q and A. Yeah, let me bring that up. Uh, so, oh, what is that? Uh, so, and I know there's a lot of questions in there. One that just came up is where can you find more information about the proposals? So check out here. Uh, I'm going to tap it into chat. Uh, it, it is just issnationallab.org. That is one place that you can go. Um, so I thought I'd just mention it here to get, uh, get good vibes from everyone, uh, next week. Uh, so there is, there is a technology and advanced research proposal, uh, that has been, that's now open for the ISS national lab. And, uh, I am putting my own proposal in to, um, launch a new 4k camera system to the International Space Station. So I can't tell a lot more about that, but it, uh, it, there's a, a, an organization that I'm working with that uh, is looking to make that happen with me. So hopefully we should, uh, uh, we should be able to, to get that up on the space station. At the moment, this camera feed behind me, um, this is actually pre-recorded right now, but uh, this is a, a low high definition it's it's 10 it's 720p and what i'm looking to have up there is uh, something that is 4k and on a steerable platform so we'll be able to point it in any direction yeah can i ask related to this question um the iss that i remember we were trying to set up something but uh you know of course, mm. i think they have some kind of leadership change uh, earlier last year but if you know, say you know, uh, there's a Bob or Eric, you know, or or, or Ron, you know, Urban, Urban uh, have uh, something, Vivian has, has something too. No, can they just give it to uh, Rocket Lab, you know, or, or, or some smaller launcher, you know, it could be cheaper, uh, or it has to go through the space uh, ISS uh, uh, lab, you know, in order to get approved, you know, to sanction. Or you can yeah. just get the long launch come and actually there are there are some more uh, small business coming up in my sorry. yeah so ISS National Lab is just for the space station um, no, you know that they're, they're an organization funded by an act of Congress and uh, the funds actually come from an allocation from NASA so uh, you know and obviously they're interested in commercialization of the International Space Station but yeah there are other ways to get your satellite into space. Um, I forgot to mention to bring up uh, a, any more information about the the suborbital flights that you can uh, get experiments on to uh, check out Blue Origin. Um, they did have some 
uh, you know, for around, uh, don't quote me on this now, but in the early days, they were allowing student experiments, uh, mostly that were coming from university level. Um, they had a few that were sponsored, but I think the costs were around $5,000. So, and obviously on a suborbital launch, your experiment is only in microgravity for around four minutes or so. Uh, so it's uh, it's not obviously for long duration experiments, but nevertheless that's possible. So and there are lots of other ways that you can get your uh, your payload to space, um, and uh, sometimes you know like if you're uh, the the Planetary Society, uh, they manage to get a free ride share with uh, with uh, another launch. So you know there's ways that you can get it to happen. NASA has other uh, proposals that are uh, that are open for you to get uh, uh, your particular experiment um, on a rocket as well. I don't know a lot about that, though. But, you know, I've got to uh, I've got to freely acknowledge there that uh, I am not an expert in that. Oh, and just while I'm doing this was this was a recording uh, while the space station was passing over the Bay Area. That's what the Bay Area looks like from space. This is so amazing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I want to have this uh, in mm. my every day. Yeah. And, and anyone, you know, this video is available uh, free to anyone. It's just streamed by NASA uh, on their Ustream channel, uh, which now is being rebranded to IBM finally. IBM purchased Ustream, I don't know, about five years ago or so. And, uh, uh, but, but this live video feed is available to the public. Um, and it just so happens that my ISS above just intelligently displays it when it's available uh because during nighttime you pretty much won't see anything on those uh, on those cameras um anyhow and i don't know if there's any other questions uh or if i've stumped everyone with uh, with with everything i've shared but i'm open to any questions that you might have um, just to impress everyone, this is one of my little boxes of uh, uh, <laughs> Raspberry Pis that, that are for projects that, uh, that I've worked on previously. Um, you know, there's, there's just a, I think if you're into this stuff, you very quickly start to um, gather new gizmos. This was, this was one of the little Arduino devices that I showed you. Uh, this one is an e-ink display. Um, that's a weather station. I just uh, I don't know if it's charged at the moment, but as it's e-ink, uh, you uh, you know that uh, it retains that image even with the power off. But uh, that's a that's a very neat thing. Um, I've got some stuff here where I was working with a Raspberry Pi and servos to point at the space station physically. Um, anyhow. Uh, you're, you're right. Actually, actually, you, uh, you talk about so actually uh, there's another uh, good application that can only be better to at the outdoor is the telescope astronomy. Mm -hmm. You know, so some people use the Raspberry Pi, you know, to control their telescope positioning, you know, stabilizing. Yeah, that's another great application. Yeah, in fact, uh, at this Your satellite, yeah, yeah, at this satellite tent that we set up at the Griffith Observatory star parties. Um, uh, my friend Justin, who is on the Mars uh, engineering team, uh, he built a system that uh, that actually tracked, uh, had the antenna track whichever satellite we were uh, wanting to communicate with or hear its beacon. Um, so he built a system that was run directly using a Raspberry Pi, uh, but it was hooked into a telescope. So it was a Celestron telescope mount. Um, but instead of a telescope on it, he actually had it uh, controlling an antenna. So he was telling the telescope where to point the antenna to. Yeah. yeah, I agree with you, Mike. Yeah, I truly miss the star parties too. <laughs> it's one of the first things that I shall be uh, interested in going out to at the Griffith Observatory. And if uh, when that does happen, you will see me there um, unless, unless there's some other thing I'm involved with that is super more important to me than that, I would be at the Griffith Observatory star parties again. Check out the Planetary Society um, uh, tent and right adjacent to that will be our satellite tent. 
Yeah, Liam actually you showed the picture of uh, uh, Bill Nye. Uh, that actually Bill Nye was with us a long time ago. Yeah, we have a couple of mm -hmm. picture uh, around 2010. He was in our event, you know, was oh, along, right. with, along with Buzz, Buzz Aldrin. You know, oh, they, were like, yeah. they were frequent visitor. And uh, I also heard from our senior member, Elon Musk, was also frequent in our uh, meetings. Uh, I couldn't shout well. Uh, it's a great heritage, you know, it's, uh, just, but Bill Knight got a little bit busy and then he moved home to East Coast. <laughs> one, one thing I noticed, you know, there's something, you see AIAA, uh, you know, I, I don't know because, you know, some people are working on defense or something, but, you know, obviously AIAA has a lot of aerospace engineers, a lot of people, they are working on satellite, but contrary to planet society, they don't have so many people working on satellite as, as they, they profession, but they have a, sat, a, a solar cell. You know that can grab the attention. So I actually try to ask AIAA if AIAA can also come up with something, you know, not light cell, but something, you know, with AIAA brand in space. Uh, but but I, I think it's a different. I think a different organization. You know, it's a uh, the way of diff, diff, different. You know. But, yeah, what, but we, what are you what are you asking about? I was asking you... there's a diff difference between the planetary society and the AIAA. So I was wondering if it's somehow AIAA can also come up with something. You know, something like a uh, some kind of sad, small sad, uh, or oh, you mean uh, AI, uh, AI, 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 build, yeah. design, and build and launch that's right. satellite? Yeah. yeah, of course you yeah. can. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That's yeah. Uh, that's that would be entirely feasible, especially you know with the kind of uh, of sponsorship that you might be able to get from your members who are yeah. in the aerospace uh, arena. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can. It's entirely feasible that uh, your STEM program could engage with students um, from many different uh, backgrounds and um, uh, to, you know, really mentor them to yeah. design and build your own satellites. I think this is the small sat uh, conference coming up soon. That may be one area to look at that, but. Actually, the small hmm. sat conference, actually, uh, in case people didn't realize uh, for many, many years, actually is, uh, uh, it was started and, uh, uh, you know, at uh, least uh, sponsored by AWA. But I think AWA has been hosting with the AWA brand. But mm. I think the recent two years, I, I saw the AWA brand was taken off. But I think there was some reason behind it. So, uh, because, uh, well, but I don't want to get, but, but it's at the, AWA has a very profound and a deep uh, connection with the, you know, this uh, small set conference. Uh, I went there for a few years ago and I saw a lot of people, they, they say they were small satellite people, new space people from, uh, uh, you know, Bay Area. And they all came, came there, you know, to, to know, try to learn what's going on. And then the, but that program, AWA program has been there for 30, 40 years. So it's, it's really, really, really amazing, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, it's yeah. I just, you know, this, this, yeah, actually, what you said is outreach to classroom, you know, this uh, is so important to school. Because I have been trying to be, my role is doing the public event. Uh, so I used to, you know, work with our STEM K-12 chair or other chair to, to support this uh, mission and the uh, STEM K-12 outreach to classroom, you know, provide uh, a course material or, or um, yeah, but, but I, I have support for event logistics. Uh, and we have a transition, but I actually, I, I pass your information to, I, I think I mentioned to you, to our uh, uh, new STEM chair, hopefully something would happen, mm -hmm. you know, because that was really, uh, you know, uh, uh, also a, a very important part for, uh, we do it slightly different, you know, because every, almost every company has a STEM program, but we do it have a, in a way. And uh, as you say, we have people launch rocket as daily, every day, you know, and uh, so, and the Oston shuttle every day, you know, it's just uh, whether they are allowed to come out to, you know, or they have time to come out to several, but we do have a lot of those people that's very different from other organizations. So it, it is really, really very, but what mm -hmm. you're doing is so inspiring. It's just unimaginable. Um, oh, thank so. you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so as again, you know, the today video will be posted. So, you know, some people they they kind of you know, but uh, Saturday Saturday they have their own thing, but they they will watch it. Sure. Yeah, I think then uh, then yeah, also yeah, yeah, you're you're going to um, uh, raffle off uh, you know a free the vi download the image for the ISS above. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you, that will be one of the things. So and it, as I say, it will work in one of those Raspberry Pi twos. Um, so <laughs> yeah. my, my image, uh, um, it won't work on a Raspberry Pi 4, and that's just because the, the Pi 4 
remember I mentioned firmware updates can break things. Uh, they completely change the way that uh, um, you access the, the graphical processing unit, the GPU. And I just haven't uh, yet reworked my code to work on a Pi Model 4. So as long as you've got a Pi Model 3 or, or older, ISS above will work just fine in that. So you're saying ISS above work uh, for uh, IS, uh, uh, three, Pi 3? Pi above. 3 and below. Yeah. Uh, so, is a Model A work as well? Model yes. A? Yeah. Because okay. that's older. So yeah, okay. uh, it probably wouldn't work on an A. <laughs> so okay, I think I the A, the A, uh, <clears throat> if you have an A, that's worth quite, that. That may yeah. be worth something. Yeah. I think they only had. Then? I think they had two hundred and fifty-six meg of RAM yeah. uh, in the original one. And so, um, but as long as it's the, I, I recommend uh, at least a um, a model. Uh, yeah, the the model two and above. Yeah, but so, uh, uh, but try it anyway. It, yeah, yeah. it will it will boot up, and it just uh, it might not be able to work very well if you have got the A with yeah. only two hundred fifty six meg of RAM. I, I can just tell you, it's just uh, for for my own ignore. So initially, as I said, I don't have enough uh, that, that many. So initially, I got this uh, head, the uh, you know uh, like Astro Pi. I was thinking to put on my original uh, Pi One B, but I just realized <laughs> the pin doesn't fit because there is a. Uh, I think there's a video output there. So yeah, you're right. In addition to compatibility of, of the, you know. Yeah, it's an analog video on yeah, the original one. Yeah, yeah, sort of that's uh, what is right here. It doesn't have an HDMI out. It has a uh, one of those yeah. <laughs> old style. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Um, th that little yellow thing there is the, is the video output. Um, yeah, it's pretty cool so, too. Yeah, but there, there we go. All right. Yeah. Well, I hope I, it. I hope my what I presented has been interesting um, to everyone who's listening. I would very much, uh, you know, recommend that if there are ways on the outreach side that you yeah, I have been trying cons mm -hmm, consider yeah, because, how to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because uh, so I, and I, I'm I'm available to support you. So yeah, I've been trying uh, to do. I think that's mm -hmm. why I was trying to. You know, uh, you, you spoke with the third, uh, uh, last year. You know, mm -hmm. the, my, my role, my function was not for outreach to school, to classroom, provide. I assist the, uh, in the past, I, I assist the, uh, the uh, STEM chat on some of the function, but mainly on logistic and the event, you know, venue or arrangement, those things, because my role is more for public, uh, right. for all event, but specifically go to classroom, which is very important. And in the past, we did get requests. Then we provide engineer or classroom material, demo material, or mm -hmm. send our people. Uh, to to there to to demo or inspire you know that's uh, 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 but but I, I think we we need to you know I, I'm very eager to to help out but I also uh, don't want to jump on other people see but I've been, mm -hmm. I've been telling others you know as always that yeah. there are certain things that we really have to do uh, that's well should very very you have been doing things wonderfully you know we, we a lot of things we, we can really uh, uh, you know uh, you know really arrange yeah. Okay. All right. Any, anything, is there anything else to, to go over now or uh, are we, uh, are we going to be released to the world? <laughs> I, I think we're, we're okay. I think it's, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you everyone. I know, you know, there's still 14 people on. Uh, very nice to have spent some time with you. I, I hope uh, as say you found what I presented of interest and uh, look forward to uh getting in contact my i'll post my email yeah. here so um to the chat so feel free to to reach out if you have anything else you want to share after this and uh, uh thank you again ken for um inviting me to uh come on the, the presentation here yeah our great pleasure and honor you know uh, as always you know it's a fantastic it's every time i feel so thrill and inspired by your talk and what you have been doing, you know, really amazing. And then we post this on video, we'll post your uh, contact on our website and video and, uh, uh, you know, uh, so more people will watch it. So. Great, great. Well, uh, have a good uh, weekend, everyone. And uh, 
wish me luck on that presentation, the, the the proposal submission. Yeah, the yeah. deadline deadline is February the twenty fifth. So oh, uh, oh, okay. it's uh, <laughs> okay. It is definitely coming up, okay. and um, you know we're not asking for a lot from the ISS National Lab. The the project scope is quite extensive, um, but uh, we will if we get if we go through this in the right way. Uh, I will likely be creating a a crowdsourced opportunity where members of the public um, and uh, private organizations, corporations can actually uh, support the running of this uh, mm -hmm. free to the public uh, live 4K from space system. So there'll be some you know really amazing things coming yeah. out of that. So you know, amazing. There's a lot between here and there that would yeah. that would that needs to be you know worked out, but. Uh, um you know this is the realist i've got the closest i've got to actually uh putting a 4k camera mm -hmm. on the outside of the station uh which has never been done before yeah. and um you know and and i'm just a guy in his if you if i took the green screen down i'm just in my office in monrovia california and mm -hmm. uh uh, probably shouldn't be doing this, <laughs> but I <laughs> yeah, haven't got I the memo. So, yeah. uh, but there'll be a point where where the members of the public can can join in this project and really feel as if they're part ownership in uh, in making a 4K uh, view from space uh, available to everyone around the world. So, yeah, I, I, can, I uh, don't, don't I can tell you some of our audience <laughs> today they actually. You know, like you, they are very passionate about some part of aerospacing they're mm. doing. You know, uh, yeah. Sometimes you kind of spend a lot of time. You know, even a little bit more close than you said. But they feel, you know, just like you, there's a passion. Passion, you know, it's a love for for the for driving you. That's uh, really amazing. That's, yeah. Uh, people really, uh, you know, respect and admire. You know, that's really very important. Uh, great trait. Great. Good people. So yeah, let us know how it goes. Thank you. you. Know, we'll cheer we'll for do. you, support you, <laughs> yeah. and uh, then we'll uh, you know cheer for you, and uh, you come back you know to talk about the great news. Great. Well, thank you all. Uh, I guess uh, I guess I will say goodbye. Oh, there you go. Yes. Nice to see you again, Ken. <laughs> so generally, I don't want to take other take attention from. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Speaker. No yeah. worries. No worries. Uh, all right. I I will I will click leave and uh, say goodbye to all anyway thanks a lot all thank you bye. thank you bye-bye bye now bye -bye. all right thank you everyone it's very exciting today uh you know so uh, stay with us and uh, let me we will uh, you know uh, uh make a uh, the, the drawing and uh, send you the uh, proper price so thank you so much again uh, stay tuned with us uh, next saturday is the uh, exciting Sustainable Aviation with Dr. Marty Bradley, AWA fellow, and uh, Dr. Bruce Holmes, also AWA fellow, and uh, a couple of leader, main leader player in this field. So stay tuned and, uh, um, you know, have a wonderful weekend. Um, thank you. Bye-bye.